Mike Chair, what's up? <laughs> Actually, she told me. I'm Lynn Gray, Chair of the Hillsborough County School Board. I want to welcome you to Hillsborough County Public Schools. We serve more than 200,000 students. That includes children in preschool through our Adults in Our Workforce program. Hi, I'm Dr. Stacy Hahn, the Board Vice Chair. Our district is the seventh largest in America, and our team is made up of more than 24,000 people working at nearly 250 sites across the county. We are diverse and dedicated. Our board meetings are held in our board auditorium on select Tuesdays at 4 p.m. The best way to serve our students and our community is to involve you, the public, in what we do. You are welcome to email or meet with any of our board members and follow our district on social media. Board meetings are covered live by Hillsborough Schools TV on Spectrum Cable Channel 635 and Frontier Cable Channel 32. 
Meetings are streamed on our website at hillsboroughschools.org. Closed captioning is provided on all broadcasts and past meetings are available in our online archives. We are interested in what the public has to say. We'll include time for audience comments before we address our business items. Our agenda and any supporting materials can be viewed online in advance. They're posted seven days before each meeting on our website at hillsboroughschools.org. Our vision is preparing students for life. And that means all students, every day. Todos los estudiantes, todos los días. Thank you for your interest in education. With your help, we're making decisions that shape she's here, but she's our not on the communities. Uh, I don't know, I don't think so. Good afternoon, everyone. The board meeting of July 13th, 2021 is called to order. Uh, with the exception of a member, Melissa Snively, who was not here at this time, uh, and member Stacy Hahn, who is not here at this time. Uh, we have Karen Perez, who is on the uh, teams. She will be listening and weighing in on her thoughts. Uh, with that being said, we do have a quorum. And now let me go ahead and introduce uh, Member Combs. Will you lead us into a moment of silence and follow us uh, all with the Pledge of Allegiance? Um, thank you. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Now please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Member Combs. We have two withdrawn items today. 403, Disciplinary Action, and 612, Renewal Purchase of Achieve 3000 for grades 3 through 12 for the 2021-2022 school year. I need a motion and a second to adopt the agenda. I have a motion by Member Hahn and a second by Member Washington. Uh, any discussion? Please correct that to oh. Uh, Member Hahn, sorry. Because uh, I'm sitting in this position. Okay, um, we will now have, we have a second by Member Washington, a first by Member Combs. Any discussion? Seeing none, please vote when your lights are on. All favorable, and uh, with Karen Perez. Karen Perez is not yet on. They're having a technical difficulty with her, but oh, she is on. I stand. Okay, they got her on. Great. Hey, Five uh, to zero. Good afternoon, Member Perez. Are you able to weigh in yet on the vote? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we have um, one, two, three, four. We have five weighing in. Thank you. Okay. Let the record reflect that Member Hahn and Member Snively are, are absent and all other board members are present with the exception of Member Hahn and Member Snively. Uh, and Member Perez is available by remote. Approval of the minutes. We have a lot of minutes to be approved today. We were very busy as a board. May 4th, the school board retreat. May 6th, the special called board meeting. May 18th, the school board meeting. May 18th, the school board workshop. June 15th, the school board meeting. June 17th, the special call board meeting. June 29th, the school board meeting. June 29th, the special call board meeting. I need a motion and a second to approve the minutes. I have a motion by Member Combs and a second by Member Washington. Will there be any discussion? 
Seeing none, please vote when your lights are on. And Member Perez? That's a yes. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Board members, I'd like to go over the format of today's meeting. <clears throat> As a reminder, this is a nonpartisan board, and the board is asked to consider our children's interests and needs first, to pave the way for efficient and efficient and effective agenda statements and or questions, board members will have three minutes to speak with 30 seconds for final thoughts. Afterward, the superintendent can respond. If you have further questions, you're asked to get back into the queue. Now, Member Combs, would you be so kind as to read the board guidelines? As we begin this afternoon's meeting, let me quickly review the format of our school board meetings. Please silence all electronic devices. There are speakers in the room behind me that allow board members to hear the meeting upon stepping away from the dais. This meeting can be viewed with closed captioning on the live webcast, on cable TV, and on video monitors here in the auditorium. It, is, it also can be viewed with closed captioning in the online video archive. Thank you, Member Combs. Um, <clears throat> so we have two items scheduled for time certain. At 5.01 p.m., we have a public hearing for recommended instructional materials for digital de design, comma, fashion, television production, comma, and world languages. At 6 p.m., we have employee input. Public comment. <clears throat> the board welcomes comments from citizens and values your input to the board. In order to provide the most comprehensive response to your comments, our staff will follow up with you and will keep our board informed about the responses. Our school board respects the public's right to speak to the board and we appreciate you taking your time to be here. <clears throat> However, it is requested when you address the board, the comments are not directly personally against a board member or staff member, but rather directly to the issues at hand. Any behavior intended to interrupt the orderly conduct of this meeting will not be allowed. Our civility policy is in place. When addressing the board, please state your name and speak clearly into the microphone. As a reminder of our way of work, we have allotted 45 minutes for public comment. However, at times when there is an issue of great interest, we could choose to extend that time. This afternoon, each speaker will have three minutes to speak. When there are 30 seconds left, instead of me saying final thoughts, you will hear hopefully a, um, a yellow light will go on and a buzzer will be heard. And following that 30 seconds, you'll hear another buzzer. So, uh, and I think at this time, uh, we'll soon be able to call up our speakers. Right now, we have time for our recognitions and proclamations. Our proclamation today will be based on the National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. And it is my pleasure, our pleasure, to have Member Washington read this proclamation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Each year, millions of Americans face the reality of living with mental illness. Through education, our district aims to decrease the stigma, provide resources, educate all stakeholders, emphasize the importance of culture and identity in the mental health movement, and advocate for policies that support our students and their families faced with mental health challenges. Mental health conditions do not discriminate. It's based on race, not based on race, color, gender, or identity. Anyone can experience the challenges of mental health regardless of their background. Formally recognized in June 2008, B.B. Moore Camera National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month has been observed each July and was created to bring awareness to the unique struggles that underpresent present peak groups face regarding mental illness in the United States. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Thank you, Member Washington. I need a motion and a second to approve the National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. I have a motion by Member Combs and a second by uh, by Member Vaughn. Thank you. Any discussion? We have a, a correct. Member Perez would like to make a comment. Uh, I see Member Washington would like to make a comment. Also? No, I was yielding to Miller, Member Perez. Okay, uh, Member Perez, thank you. Thank you, and thank, thank you so much for bringing up this proclamation. Um, recently, we had a tennis um, player who mentioned that it's okay not to be okay. And we see that, you know, across um, our mental health, that, like um, Member Washington mentioned, that mental health does not discriminate. And, you know, um, the fact that here in Hillsborough County Schools that we provide mental health services for anyone and everyone who um, needs them, and not only for our students, but for their families. So thank you so much for bringing up this proclamation and um, always, always keeping mental health first and foremost, you know, for our families. Thank you. Thank you, Member Perez. Uh, Member Vaughn? Um, I wasn't in the queue to speak, but I, I don't mind. Um, I think it's really important that in every community where we're moving and working really hard to remove any stigma associated with mental health. Um, so I'm just, I'm really glad to see this um, proclamation to make sure that, you know, we're reaching across all communities that might have stigmas and um, advocating for mental health and making sure it's accessible. So thank you. Thank you, Ma Member Vaughn, for speaking right right from the heart and right away. Uh, so I also agree very much, and I think all of us right now on the dais are educators, and we all know that before the mind will learn and absorb academics, their mind and their well-being must be addressed. And that is so key and critical, and we are also reminded that our superintendent uh, is taking, we're spending a lot of money, as we should, to the efforts of mental health. And uh, that will be probably highlighted uh, during this board's meeting. But uh, board members are very keenly aware and of the importance of mental health for all race, color, and genders uh, and or identities. Uh, I need your vote at this point in time. Please vote when your lights are on. Okay, it is unanimous, uh, and Member Perez also, and again, Member Snively and Member um, Hahn are not at this meeting at this time. Okay, we're going to go ahead, and we're moving right on to the consent agenda. Uh, we need to do public comment before the consent. Are we ready for public comment? Okay. All right. Um, let's go ahead, and we'll begin. I'm going to call out your names, probably four of you at a time, and... Um, three minutes each so you know the drill because I already went back there and talked to some of you. So we're going to go ahead and uh, look forward to your comments. Uh, first, uh, Jessica Dubois, uh, Gutilio gonzalez Malalari, Mark Clutho, Scott Height, and then Deborah Seltzer. You may come forward to the uh, microphone. And uh, you may have to adjust the microphone because I think it's a little bit low. Um, Mr. Porter, would you like to help with the adjustment of the microphone? I didn't forget it was in uh, gray. Okay. Um, Ms. McDonald, are you front and centered? <laughs> Hi, I, um, I apologize. Um, your name is up at the top, but it had a yeah, it was highlighted, so you should feel extra special. And uh, good afternoon, Ms. McDonald. Hello, my name is Veronica McDonald. Hillsborough County has been highlighted nationally lately for pushing back and stopping the rubber stamping of charters and reinstating accountability. The State Board of Education has taken notice and will be discussing possible actions at their meeting tomorrow for the school board's vote for charter non-renewals. This meeting is tomorrow at 9 a.m. at St. Pete College, and it is and it is here where it will be discussed whether or not our school board broke the law in denying four charter schools. 
It seems the state is posturing to withhold money unless the school board reverses its decision. The state indicates that our board violated law by not giving a 90-day notice before the expiration of charters that were up for renewal. I'd like to make it very clear that our school board received the notice of renewal of these charters two weeks before the 14 days, give or take, before these charters expired. The burden of responsibility of notifying the school board rests on the superintendent of schools and any action that is taken by the state to withhold funds will be due to negligence and not performing those duties. There's previously been public outcry to remove the superintendent due to teacher cuts. Will Commissioner Corcoran let the superintendent take this fall so that he can make a point that local control means that he controls locally? Thank you. Jessica Dubois. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Jessica and I'm here representing thousands as part of Hillsborough Public School Advocates. One of the tenets of our group is to review agenda items and make sure they're a good decision for teachers, taxpayers, but also for our student body. We strongly encourage a no vote on Achieve 3000, which I know was withdrawn today and will be happening later this month potentially. The average improvement index is only three to six percentile points out of 50. We also took an unofficial survey asking thousands of parents and teachers to weigh in on their experiences. One teacher mentioned spending hours online with tech support and not getting a resolution she needed. We also had many responses stating programs like CommonLit that are free have better resources and experiences. But the most troubling statistic came from Hooper's evaluation provided to this board stating, the achievement gap for Title I and ELL students grew from pre to post test. We should be providing bodies in the classroom to help with reading, and we should especially consider our ELL and ESE students with the decisions we make. Secondly, we encourage a no vote on SEL digital curriculum, including news, ELA, and second step. Our children need to play at recess and teachers learn firsthand when to intervene and when to let students sort through a problem on their own. And here is one time I actually agree with Corcoran when he stated at Hillsdale College earlier this year, more tech in classrooms than anywhere else in the world and it's been an overwhelming failure, not a success. Thirdly, the State Board of Education is meeting and discussing this board's charter non-renewal decision. I'll be there once again supporting your decision. You reviewed the data, you were provided, did your research, and voted on the issue when you were prompted. Exactly what we would expect from, a vo from an elected official. And thank you, I'll be there to support you. My call to action is let's go with our gut, board members. As you highlighted, you're all educators in, the, in your past lives. Let kids learn from play and less technology. Screen time is shown to negatively impact our kids' attention spans and less social interaction leads to a myriad of issues down the road. We also ask for a yes vote on the budget CAC today. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Gutilio Maratari, I'm, you're going to help me with that. Uh, Mark Lutho and Scott. You'll get it right eventually, ma'am. I don't know about that. Go ahead and pronounce All it. All right. First. Yeah, Jatulio Gonzalez Militieri. And, uh, you know, shout out to the Bolts for winning. We're still Champa Bay. Um, so, yeah. Forgive me if I don't know the minutia of the Edgenuity Virtual Instruction Program, but as a student myself who has, you know, had the privilege of attending online classes during the pandemic, I can only describe the process of educating myself. And this isn't hyperbole. I am educating myself uh, through a computer monitor and software is mind numbing. Now, imagine undergoing this process as an ESC student or a student receiving an education through the, the Department of Juvenile Justice. These are adolescents that need to be engaged and need to have their minds stimulated. Having been targeted by the school to prison pipeline as a teenager myself, I have dedicated a large part of my studies on finding ways to dismantle it. I can only assure you that having computer software operating in the place of a teacher is not one of them. The district is debating on whether or not they should dedicate approximately a million dollars, a million dollars towards this program. This is a folly. Does this board not believe in equity? If so, then how can you expect our most at-risk youth to succeed under this program? I'll leave you with this. According to Emeritus Professor Joseph Tolman, an estimated 90% of incarcerated students are behind their grade in literacy and qualify for ESE. Computer software won't fix that. Please look for better alternatives. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Mark Clutho, followed by Scott Hyde, followed by Deborah Zelsa. Good afternoon, Mr. Clutho. Mark Clutho, uh, 101, 202, 103. Uh, here you are feeding the uh, war machine. Yeah, I guess you all haven't read the uh, short book by Smedley Butler, War is a Racket. Yeah, the sickness continues to go on. Such a shame. Such a doggone shame. Yes. Here's some latest headlines. Arctic's last ice area is not resistant to global warming. There's a story behind it. And here's the headline. Climate scientists warned us. When will we listen? Well, you know, I've been bringing science that would help. And you just keep ignoring it making sick buildings that belch carbon into the atmosphere. Here they are in New York, giving aging buildings a green makeover. Developers are devising ways to retrofit New York's oldest structures to reduce their carbon footprints, cutting the utility bills by 80%. You could have done even better with new buildings that you were making at a lower price. There's a headline, huge changes needed to keep nature. Earth OK, report says, get ready for climate disasters. Yeah, that last one that just came by, if it would have been a month from now, would have been a different story. Only big steps will save Earth. Earth's carbon dioxide levels at highest level in 4 million years. And at that time, 4 million years ago, Florida would have been completely underwater. It's just a matter of time before things catch up to that stage. A crisis at iconic Hoover Dam, nation's largest reservoir sinking to lowest levels ever. You know, the science is there, but you fools just keep ignoring it. And future generations are going to look back and say, why? What was your problem? Thank you, Mr. Clutho. Next, we'll hear from Scott Height, Deborah Selsa, Kurt uh, Thorson and then Teresa Potter. Hi, guys. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Scott Hyde. from West Chase. Um, just addressing the issue of the charter schools. Um, we've learned over the past year that the level of power of the Florida Department of Education has grown wildly out of balance. And now that it's both out of touch and at odds with the basic needs and choices made by the local districts and the people they represent, Richard Corcoran and the DOE's combative stance is revealing. They are undeveloped as communicators, unable to engage in a fruitful conversation, and most alarmingly, they seem to think supporting their friends for for-profit management companies is more important than making our funds, make sure our funds are going to the students who need them. There's just no logical reason to renew contracts with charter schools that have failed to deliver or even meet the basic requirements, especially when we're in a budgetary crisis. So with no logical explanation for Corcoran's combative demands, it's clear he isn't dr driven by logic or budget or even equality. He's driven by a private agenda. His goals are profit and power, not fairness, and certainly not excellence in education. This situation is truly a tragedy for our kids growing up here in Florida. A lot has changed since Richard Corcoran landed his first job. At one point, the future looked pretty good for him because no one was really paying attention. But it's all changed now. Transparency is a requirement that, thanks not only to the internet, but social media. So we have federal fund withholding 
combative, unprofessional written threats, baseless arguments, and wasted time. So everyone can see this now. Those who have taken a secrecy to push a private agenda can't hide anymore. They'll have to live with the legacy of the public going against, the, they're going against the will of the public for their own personal gain. And we are all watching. So we believe we're on the right side of history. So tomorrow when they're busy threatening and intimidating, ask yourself, are these threats and intimidation what we want for our kids growing up in Florida? I don't think so. We all agree the answer is no. Put the needs of thousands of students and families in Hillsborough County before the private interests of a few people in Tallahassee and the private companies that they serve. Do the right thing. Stand up to this bullying. The community will support you for doing the right thing. And thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Next will be Deborah Selsa, uh, Setzer. Setzer. I don't know where I got the L from, um, but I apologize. Kurt Thorison and Teresa Potter, then Pat Hall. And good afternoon. Hi. That's okay. Everyone wants to do that. <laughs> the L. Okay. Uh. Uh, I'm Deborah Setzer. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. I have three points that I want to address to the board and to Superintendent Davis. One, I really want to thank this board for holding charter schools accountable and really taking a critical eye to reviewing them and making sure that they're holding up to the standards that we hold the rest of the public schools up to. I really appreciate that. Two, I urge the board to appoint a community advisory board so that you can make sure that you're really getting great input from the community and from the parents. And number three, thank you for requiring masks in the school last year. Please do so again for children under the age of 12 who do not yet have the opportunity to be vaccinated. I know these decisions are really difficult and it's really hard to please both sides, so we can't. But what we had hoped was that COVID would be behind us. We wouldn't have to have masks, we wouldn't have to worry about it. That would be great, but we have to face facts. Unfortunately, cases are on the rise in the state of Florida. We have the Delta variant here that's becoming more and more prevalent and is much more easily transmissible. We also know that masks, they mostly protect others around us, not so much the wearer. So optional masks don't work well, especially for our unvaccinated children. What I urge you to do is not listen so much to popular opinion but listen to the CDC. That's what they're there for. They just updated their guidance on schools. What they said is pretty consistent with what they've been saying, and that's that anyone who is unvaccinated needs to wear a mask in an indoor setting. Practically, this could mean just requiring masks for a few weeks for those under the age of 12 who don't yet have the opportunity to be vaccinated if they choose to be vaccinated. Requiring masks for the unvaccinated is so important now, again, with that Delta variant, and it's being so much more easily transmissible in cases on the rise. Please do your part to protect our kids who can't yet protect themselves with a vaccine and to protect our staff. Thank you for considering science. So in summary, please continue to hold those charter schools accountable. Please account uh, have a community advisory board and require masks next year for a few weeks for K through eight. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> next, we'll have Kurt Thorson, followed by Teresa Potter, then Pat Hall, and then Jennifer Hart. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I think I today, but it looks like I'm well, we we actually I, I'm going to make a remark about that soon, but not yet. You go ahead and my, take my over. My voice might sound a little scratchy. There was a boat parade yesterday. <laughs> Forgive me. All right, uh, well, good afternoon, board members and Superintendent Davis. Uh, I've been a teacher in the Hillsborough schools for 10 years. I've always cared in, for and expected a great deal from my students in AP Biology, Chemistry, Anatomy, and Physiology. I'm expecting us to break some records next year when AP scores are released, or next week. In my classes, in the spirit of holding my students account or academically accountable, I've often had to tell them sometimes I have to save you from yourselves. This is typically in reference to the occasional adolescent complacency or the use of an unsanctioned uh, shortcut. Well, now I come to you for your leadership, your guidance, and your authority 
uh, to help save our students from themselves, not from academic complacency or dishonesty, but from vaping and drug use in schools. Mm -hmm. Before the COVID-19 pandemic hit, uh, schools across America, Florida, and Tampa Bay were pursuing legal action against vaping companies for marketing their product to children. Um, I don't know if this leadership can right now actively or cite a plan that is being active in our schools that's being implemented in Hillsborough schools that aims to discourage students from vaping and give school administrations the tea to discipline those who vape on campus. If you remember how well you hid things from your parents and teachers, I'm sure you do, I know I do, well, the students today know how to do it and they know how to do it better than we did. They know how to hide it, they know how to get away with it, and I'm there every day, and I can assure you, they are beating the system. Vaping in adolescence has proven to cause addiction, anxiety, depression, distracted learning, and altered brain development. Vaping is a nuisance in schools and is a very real threat to the learning process. If you walk into a high school bathroom in America, you may find a crowd of students vaping in between classes. I can confirm this, and I have walked in on them on countless occasions. There's been no decline in this epidemic, and I ask that the leadership here formulate a district-wide plan to curtail this issue in Hillsborough schools. As a science teacher, I try to educate my students on the very real health and physical dangers of vaping, but I cannot attack and solve this issue alone. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, we'll, uh, we will hear from Teresa Potter, Pat Hall, Jennifer Hart, and then Damaris Bridges. And good afternoon, Ms. Potter. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Teresa Potter. I'm the president-elect and the chair of the Education Action Group for the Hillsborough County League of Women Voters. I'm an educator, a one-time Ida S. Baker Diversity Teacher of the Year school nominee for a Title I school here in Hillsborough County. I'm the mother of two boys who graduated from Hillsborough County Public Schools in the pandemic years of 2020 and 2021. And although I'm not currently a parent of a K-12 student and I'm not currently a practicing practicing educator. I'm a taxpayer, I'm a voter, and I will always be a public school advocate. So I want to thank this board for very being very deliberate in making sure that each action you take supports and protects the rights of all students. For making sure that all students receive the services that they need and deserve. And for working towards the end goal, that all students receive an equal education as required by the Florida Constitution. With the state shifting our taxpayer dollars to pockets of students outside of our neighborhood school system, over a billion dollars this year, it's especially important to be deliberate in how each dollar that we do have is spent. So I thank you for scrutinizing the use of outside vendors, especially online programming, and hope to see more detail in how each tool is being used in our schools. Others will talk today, as some have already, about Achieve 3000. So I will just concur with the concern that reports show that the program has not been successful in narrowing the learning gap with our ELL students or students in Title I schools, and that educators have reported substantial issues with implementation. This same concern applies to other vendors as well. For each vendor, we should be able to see exactly how the program will be used, how many students will be using it, which schools, which grade levels, as well as the per student cost. For example, Edgenuity is on the agenda today. The description shows last year's usage numbers, which we know is expanded for e-learning. But this three-year contract is for credit recovery courses only at most schools. We're glad to see it's not being used in Hillsborough Virtual School, but it's not clear how many students are expected to use this program for 900,000 per year. Since it's a set amount rather than a per student cost, it is difficult to know how much it costs per student and how much it is expected to be utilized at each school. It would probably be more valid to show pre-pandemic usage than last year's number. Please continue to be very deliberate with each dollar spent especially with multi-year contracts that lock down millions of future dollars on programs without identifying the cost on a per student basis and without determining exactly which students can benefit from them. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Ms. Potter. Uh, next, we have Pat Hall, Jennifer Hart, Damaris Bridges, and Allison Fernandez. 
Good afternoon, Hello. Ms. Hall. My name is Pat Hall, um, and I'm here to talk on several subjects. For parents who need new choices of school, their choices are any other charter school, a district magnet school, a traditional public school, or a private school they can pay for. On another subject, Achieve 3000. As several people have stated, the summary results show that children with ELL needs and children in Title I schools are not well served by this computer system. They did not improve and their achievement gap widened this past year. Radical idea. Hire passionate people who want to teach little ones the joy of reading, teacher aides, so they could have small group instruction or one-on-one -on -one read aloud sessions to connect personally with little kids. How many millions would that cost? Are some of the SR funds supposed to be used to help this population? I believe so. Achieve 3000 is not right for all children and schools. Limit it where it has shown promise. If you have been in a school recently, there are never enough computers to go around and media centers stay closed for days, months, for endless testing. Maybe Achieve isn't testing, but grading is involved, so who's kidding who? Um, since Woodmont was an issue in the editorial pages this week, here are the grades since opening in 2011. D, F, C, D, 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 until they got two Bs when they had a new principal who could finagle the numbers better. Um, Mr. Corcoran's bullying techniques and malarkey regarding 90 days this and that, why is he skipping the many violations of state and federal law related to exceptional students? I don't see that in his fun letters. Charter schools only get one announced site visit per year. The rest of the year, they're free to do whatever in the world they want. Overcrowded classrooms, substitute teachers, ESE violations. Thank you for the clearly written 90-day letters with relevant rationale for denials. Can Corcoran count to 90? Thank you, Ms. Hall. Next, we'll hear from Jennifer Hart, followed by Damaris Bridges, Allison Fernandez, and then Stephanie Baxter Jenkins. Good afternoon, Ms. Hart. Hey, how are you? I feel like that previous speaker needed like a mic drop. All right. Good afternoon, school board. My name is Jennifer Hart. I'm here to speak to you as a constituent, a mother of a student in Hillsborough County, and a veteran teacher of 17 years. First, I'd like to thank you for upholding your vote to, I believe, send a message that Hillsborough County is not open to any and all charter schools anymore, and that they will be held to the same standards as any other public schools. We must ensure that schools provide students with a high-quality education, and in our current budget crisis, we can't continue to divert more funds from our already starving public schools, so thank you. Please continue to hold strong in your resolve. We realize our state government is trying to pave the way to school privatization just as fast as they can, and that they will threaten our county with withholding funds, say are you saying you are breaking the law, saying they're going to take over our district, etc., etc., but please continue to fight. Secondly, although it is no longer on the agenda tonight, I would like to, as a third grade language arts teacher, comment on Achieve 3000 and encourage you to vote to no longer keep that contract in our school district. In schools like mine, we just do not have enough technology to implement it easily. I felt like there was a constant shuffle of kids on and off computers as teachers tried to keep track of minutes and lessons completed. Um, also, this is on top of iReady in some cases, and speaking of iReady, iReady was already sufficient for data collection through a computer program iReady is more user friendly for teachers, actually, and students, and has more of an instructional component, whereas Achieve 3000 is mostly reading and answering questions. I also feel that iReady gives more in depth feedback on student progress with remediation lesson ideas to support students with concepts they are struggling with. On top of all that, though, 
the, really the important thing is research and studies have shown over and over again that the most important key for student learning success is instruction from a qualified teacher. Teachers need to be able to pull small groups to provide additional instructional interventions for Tier 2 and Tier 3 students. They need to pull small groups to provide remediation for each and every lesson every day to address standards and skills that students may need additional support with. And on top of that, we also need to pull some good old-fashioned guided reading groups to differentiate for our students. Uh, teachers are feeling like time is being pulled from these extremely important instructional opportunities to make sure students complete enough tasks on a computer program. I can't help but feel like Achieve 3000 feels to most students like a task to be checked off of their to-do list. It's not fostering a love of learning and reading and books through real genuine interaction with their peers and teachers around literature and not just excerpts and articles. So please consider voting to not renew Achieve 3000 for the upcoming school year. Thank you. Good. Thank you. And now we're going to hear from Damaris Bridges, followed by Allison Fernandez, Stephanie Baxter Jenkins, and then Michelle Kenoya. Kanuya. <laughs> Good evening, Damaris Bridges. Good evening. I have a handout. I'll get to it in a second. Um, the first thing I want to do is thank you for your legislative priorities that you will hopefully approve during this uh, meeting today. They are fantastically um, specific, which is the first time in a very long time. And as someone who spends a lot of time talking to people on the legislature, it is very, very, very important to be specific in our asks. So thank you for your bold leadership in that. Also, I want to talk about the financial uh, CAC, and thank you for, I hope that you will all vote for it. Also, the other thing I want to say with that is I want to encourage you to look at the idea of appointing alternates. They wouldn't have a voice, vote or a voice, but it would allow you to build your bench. The more people that we have understanding, having a good understanding of this budget and finance committee, the better off we are. And it would also make sure that you have representation there all the time. So say, for example, the representation from District 5 cannot be there, you have an alternate to take their place. Um, and then it also builds the bench as you are looking to appoint new people on the committee because we all know this budget is incredibly complex and it takes some time to digest and learn. In addition to that, I want to talk to you about the flyer, the handout you have in front of you. This is from the BOCC. Um, basically, last time we came together, I asked that you have a more robust reporting system for lobbyists. And what this is, is your lobbyists are obviously registered, but this goes one step further. This this generates a quarterly report that states when the lobby, who the lobbyists are meeting with and what is the purpose of the meeting. And this is readily available on the BOCC website. And so it's incredibly helpful and transparent for your constituents. And the last thing I want to talk to you about is tech. Um, I can tell you that my kids, if they were in elementary school right now, would spend more time on a computer in school than I ever allowed them to do outside of school. And that, to me, is incredibly problematic. Richard Corcoran, as it was referenced earlier, said we have, without a doubt, more tech in classrooms than anywhere else in the world, and has been overwhelmingly a failure and not a success. I want to remind you that when we came back to school last year, the reasoning be that we had was was that our kids needed to be in front of teachers and not computers. So do not replace those teachers with computers in the classroom. All of the feedback I've received from my household on things like Achieve 3000 and going on the computer, my kids tune out and they don't pay attention and they start just pressing whatever. And so I question the quality of the data that you're getting back as well, because if they don't feel engaged, then that is problematic. So I really want to encourage you, invest in teachers, invest in people, because people invest in people. You've never seen a person look at a computer screen and say, oh, I feel so loved by that computer screen. In fact, the opposite happens. That's one of the reasons we limited it in my household. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, following Ms. Bridges will be Allison Fernandez, Stephanie Baxter Jenkins, and Michelle Kinover. Good and afternoon, good board members, Allison Fernandez. Uh, I want to speak on a several different topics tonight. One, I want to say uh, whether your choice to uphold, to not renew the charters will stand or not stand is separate. All of the concerns that people expressed about not renewing those charters are all problems that exist in current traditional public schools. And I listened at the last meeting to some of the suggestions that 
were made and, and some of the improvements that might be coming forward from administration, and they really all sound like more of the same that you've been doing year after year. That's not working. So what I, the conclusion that I have come to is a lot of decisions and, ch and changes that could be made in the district are limited because of the financial issue. Well, I really, I implore you to create this citizen financial committee, and I request that you put people on it that have accounting knowledge, and especially some governmental accounting knowledge. Um, you're running a 3.5 or $3.3 billion budget in this industry, and you all don't have all of the tools that you need to measure the effectiveness of what's going on and what you're spending your money on. So I ask you to do that, and I ask you to look at completely different approaches to reaching children that are showing that they're not succeeding. And I also want to point out that parent choice is the number one consideration. Um, charter schools wouldn't exist without parents choosing them. So there is value in the parent choice. The particular schools that you might not have renewed, maybe they weren't doing what they needed to do. Consider that you have existing schools that are not doing what they need to do. Um, but parent choice is, is, should be number one. And also I'd like to remind you that the parents who put their children in a charter school are also taxpayers. So they're not diverting, they're choosing to move their children to a different industry or different school situation. Um, again, can we look at the problems that we have in the existing charter schools and find a way to balance that with what we're doing in our traditional public schools because we're not balancing that very well. If you look at the school grades from Greco Middle School, they're going to look an awful lot like Woodmont Charter School. You didn't renew that one. Greco still exists. So I'm asking you to create the Citizen Financial Committee and staff it with people that understand accounting. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> At this time, we'll hear Stephanie Baxter Jenkins and then followed by Michelle Kenoya. And good evening. Good evening. Um, I have a couple things, uh, as with other speakers, that I wanted to uh, talk to all of you about tonight. I'm not sure if all of you are aware, but we as a district uh, sent about 12,000 names to the governor's office for the $1,000 that supposedly the governor is going to be giving out. Um, I want to... I think it goes without saying that, number one, um, I don't appreciate political ploys in lieu of actually valuing our employees. But beyond that, um, people still do work in this district and all of our employees our school social workers, our counselors, our ESPs. Um, I, I could go on and on with every job description, but all those people helped get our schools up and running, every single one of them, and they kept them open, and they got our kids educated through a pandemic. And so I want to impress upon all of you that however you are going to go forward with ESSER dollars and Recovery Act dollars, we do need to consider evening this out for all of our employees. Uh, on a similar note, as you all know, our ESPs have received nothing and we have still not been back at the bargaining table. Um, Rob Creed is not here this week, so I'm gonna reiterate his common request that that is again a hugely important thing we do. I wanna thank um, those members of the school board that have been pushing strongly to move forward with that. Um, on this charter school piece, I feel like people have um, Lots of our parents are obviously very well educated on this and, and have spoken a lot. I do wanna say, just from the perspective again of supporting all of you as decision makers, you have local control what happens in this district. I know there are people who would like to tell you it's really their, you know, their control. I know Richard Corcoran would like you to make, let him make the decisions but there is a legal process. There is nothing you've done that isn't fully legal. You have lawyers, there's a process that this whole thing will go through. And that is all that needs to be said to people. 
Um, I, I think this notion of pressuring pressuring all of you that that was somehow the wrong decision is is sort of crazy because it is your job to make sure those schools are providing for children and again doing so in the same way all of our schools are held to. So I thank you all for the time. Have a good night. Thank you, Stephanie Baxter Jenkins. Uh, Michelle Kenovia. Kenovia. All right, you'll have to fix my uh, pronunciation. And good evening. I did get it. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Um, my name is Michelle Knoyer, and I am one of many public school advocates in this county speaking. I have two young adult sons who both received their education in Hillsborough County Public Schools. My sister is currently a public school ESE teacher in this county as well. I recently learned of a speech that Richard Corcoran, Florida's Commissioner of Education, delivered during a lecture at Hillsdale College in Michigan. I'm not sure why he's giving lectures in Michigan rather than attending to the needs of families and teachers in Florida, but apparently Corcoran intends for half of Florida schools to be privatized or at least chartered. Proponents of such measures insist that privatization of our public schools will help to eliminate failing schools so children will receive what they call quality education. If that is their worry, then why not fully fund our existing public schools so that every child in Florida can receive a quality education? Public school educators work very hard and endless hours and under the most spartan of financial conditions and most recently challenging circumstances in the wake of a global pandemic to ensure that every child entrusted with their education as they grow into adults receives rigorous quality education. I saw this determination in my son's teachers, elementary through high school, and I see it in my sister's teaching of her own students. It's high time that public schools in Hillsborough County receive full funding so that both our teachers and our children can flourish. It's also time for the Hillsborough County School Board to vote yes on the creation of an Audit Citizens Advisory Council, or CAC, to be a second set of eyes to review budget items before approval, which will generate trust in our public schools and the way they are funded. Thank you for listening to my concerns as a Hillsborough County Public School alumni parent and thank you for all you do. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, speakers, for uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, we encourage speakers to, to please continue to do so. Uh, we just wanted to do a segue here. Uh, the board members wanted to show, show and share support for the Tampa Bay Lightning. And as a consequence, I had them all wear shirts. Uh, and uh, we did go on the the um what was the name of the boat uh, member not uh starlight yeah it was the starlight but anyway we have collector item shirts and we do support the rays and we do support all business uh and sports owners but we uh we're very proud that they represent our tampa bay area and the various communities so uh excellent job second stanley cup amazing that's what i call great competition and thank you board members for uh sharing uh your enthusiasm um and i think that's enough of that unless you have something else to say superintendent davis on the subject <laughs> no ma'am um, uh, i think it, they look great uh, tonight i'm sporting a jersey in support uh, I, know I was going to say maybe you might want to make a remark about why your shirt is different than <laughs> <laughs> or it was an option for me to kind of join in and, uh, you know, partake into a shirt such as the board. However, the, the Bolts were really nice and generous last year when they were going to the first Stanley Cup and provided a jersey to the district. So, um, you know, I want to make sure I represent and appreciate their, their token of appreciation. And I gave, that, gave this jersey to the communications team. So whomever decides to need it and whenever, they can check it out or use it. And uh, so I'm grateful tonight I had to check it out. Thank you to Tanya. She did a really wonderful job making sure it's available tonight. But uh, just to show appreciation, I elected not to participate in the parade. And they get a chance to speak to students yesterday and part of the Career Source on um, a Leadership uh, Youth Academy. And uh, it was a really great opportunity for me to speak to them. But I'm glad each of you got a chance to, to enjoy that parade. Nice for our community and nice for, you know, for, for us to be back-to-back -back champions. Thank you, <clears throat> Superintendent Davis. I will share also that Member Snively and Member Hahn also have the shirts, and they are also, in their own way, celebrating 
the uh, the win from the uh, bolts <clears throat> and member Perez I believe have the shirt on I can see almost all of it so thanks absolutely a hundred percent all right um, okay we're going to go ahead and do a real quick uh, vote I need a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda I have a motion by member Combs a second by member Washington uh, and please vote when your lights appear <clears throat> and uh, with a commitment of yeses with uh, member Perez thank you member Perez uh, we have uh, passed the consent agenda now we have a time certain item 501 and uh, that is I believe what I have is the uh, student code of conduct is that correct we're going to have a uh, discussion on that if that not be the case uh, then we'll go ahead and move with our normal agenda Madam Chair, the, the 501 public hearing is for the um, recommended instructional materials for digital design, fashion, television, production, and world languages. That's a 501. Yep. Okay, well then that clears that up. Uh, let's see what we can do on that. Let's b begin. Oh, it's, if we could, it's not quite, the, the, it was advertised for 501, just to be technical, we have a few minutes to go. So um, it's 458, I need to sort of wait until 501. Okay. All right, we'll go ahead and move uh, right on through. Uh, the consent agenda has been approved, and we're up to the superintendent comments. Superintendent Davis, uh, go ahead. Yes, ma'am, to the chair. I'll, I'll go ahead, and tonight I'll be really brief on my comments. I know that may be a, a gift or something new. Usually I like to have an extensive yeah. PowerPoint, but uh, <laughs> we'll have uh, a couple celebrations. Tonight's just about, you know, some acknowledging some of our hard workers and some of the great celebrations in our high schools. As you know, we have uh, some really robust IB programs within uh, Hillsborough County Public Schools and just wanted to identify the success rates and the diploma rates that we have accomplished this school year. These uh, Hillsborough County Public Schools uh, continue to achieve uh, impressive uh, diploma rates and finishing the academic year one of the highest you know accomplishments rates and diploma rates in district history if we look at Hillsboro High School they had a hundred percent of their students that are engaged in IB they graduate all of them graduated with their with their IB diplomas a major celebration this is a four percent increase over 2020 and you see that this is the third time in their history that they had a hundred percent acknowledgement or are fulfilling that obligation and look at King look at Robinson and Strawberry Crest as well once again, you start to see great movement and historical than they've, they've had. And this is all the concentration of our students, of our teachers, of our coordinators, of our assistant principals, our principals, our parents, all to be actively engaged in this process. And one thing we can continue to do is make certain that, uh, you know, that our IB students are continue to be exposed to rigorous content, rigorous uh, classrooms where they can continue to show and, um, and demonstrate their ability to compete inside and outside of our classrooms every single day. This is an exceptional uh, hard work and consideration, and uh, we're, we're thankful for the hard work that Matt Morano does as well and Mr. Cox in, the, in our magnet programs to make sure this is a continued reality within, within our school district. And as you see, we are continuing to outperform uh, the national and international rates for completion with the IB diplomas, which is ranged between the high 60s and the mid 70s within our school district. So hats off to our high schools. Keep working hard. And thank you to our students to being connected to this process. And then also we have, you know, uh, another opportunity to highlight one of our educators. We've been informed by the Department of Education that uh, one of our teachers who was uh, Mrs. Romano, she has currently been acknowledged as a selection committee as one of the finalists for Florida Selection Committee for the Presidential Award for Excellence in Mathematics and Science of Teaching. And this is just a chance for her to go to the national wave to be recognized within our school district. Mrs. Romano will lead the efforts as an IB coordinator next year at Alonzo. But this is, uh, you know, of these, there's only three finalists in the state of Florida. And uh, each 
each award categorical is forwarded to the National Selection Committee for STEM education, and they get a chance for those who are selected to be the, to the recipient of this presidential award. They'll be notified by the White House and also honored in Washington, D.C., and then also be, they will receive $10,000 from the, the, the Science Foundation to join a, a cadre of award-winning teachers to be able to continue to push STEM within our, within our school district and throughout the nation. So hats off to Ms. Romano. We thank her for her continued efforts and her hard work and being recognized by the Department of Education. And then openly, that's it. Just a couple celebrations. As you know, we'll have a leadership institute that will take place starting next week. And, uh, you know, being here for, you know, going on to the, you know, 17 months, this will be the first time that I get a chance to be in front of all of our principals at one time. You know, we've all had some really trying times with COVID, so I'm just excited to be able to get everyone in the same room to talk about our vision, talk about our way of work, and how we can further support our principals and assist the principals as we move forward. The first two days will be our Principal Institute on the 19th and 20th, and the next two days will be the 20th and 20, 21st and 22nd for the Assistant Principal uh, Leadership Institute to really focus on way of work and how we will continue to, um, to further support students and our teachers within our organization. So thank you. Those were great highlights. Uh, we have a comment from Member Perez. And uh, we have a comment from Member Vaughn. Member Perez. Thank you. Thank you for this, um, uh, highlighting the IB programs. This is great. And, you know, the fact that, you know, we outrank the, the national the average. Um, um, percentages is fantastic. But do you have the demographic breakdowns as far as the students that um, receive these IV um, diplomas? Ms. Perez, we can get that information to you without a doubt. We can give you uh, all of the demographic breakdowns and the, those students who are engaged, enrolled, and their completion rates as well. Fantastic. Yes, I appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you for highlighting this. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Member Perez. Member Vaughn? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Superintendent Davis, I was just wondering um, to carry over from some of the updates that you're doing, if you could give us a little bit of update on um, the COVID-19. I know we had decided, you had decided that we were going to keep masks optional, but um, that was also reflective on what the data looked like in the CDD, CDC as things were kind of changing. And I know with the, the new variant, there's some concerns. So I've had some constituents who have contacted me about that. So I was wondering if we could do an update. And then also I've had a lot of constituents ask me about our ESSER funds and where that's at and whether we're going to get that and if not, where the holdup is. And so if you could give me an update on that as well, I'd appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Vaughn, thank you for really good questions. One thing we did do is be very, very transparent with our community to tell them that we would always continue to work with our local health uh, experts in the Department of Health to determine and watch COVID, the implementation, and our positive rates. Uh, we have uh, continued to use and leverage uh, the look at summer school and how the overall COVID, how COVID is interacting in our summer school. Currently, we've been in summer school for 22 days to date, and of that, we've had 23 positive cases. Of the 23 positive cases, 12 have been identified as learners, and two of those are at adult career centers. So really, at 22 days, we've had uh, 10 students that have been identified to be positive through COVID, and know that we have over 13,000 students that are engaged in our summer school programming. Um, with that said, the CDC guidelines were updated on July the 9th. And in that, there were recommendations for those uh, individuals who have not been vaccinated due to, to wear masks indoors. Um, it also went on to say that um, if school districts, because there are recommendations, there's a recommendation to make certain that we have masks. We know that students who are under 12 years old do not have the availability for vaccinations at this particular time. Uh, we do see through popular demand and uh, in, th in looking through implementations that um, that masks have went away in, in, in a number of areas, especially through education, within our communities, within the grocery stores, with, within businesses. And when we look at the CDC guidelines, there is a identification that if organizations or entities, school entities are not going to implement masks, for the are, are not going to take the recommendations for CDC guidelines and one thing they recommend is wearing masks and social distancing to, that they take the initiative to not to abandon both of those areas to be able to do it in a staircase approach so meaning that please you know they're asking that we not take away social distancing and mask at the same time therefore at, at our at this time we'll continue to work with local medical experts masks will be optional 
We'll continue to, to review that elements. We have once a week conversations. So while we will, uh, masks will be optional at this time for next year, we will continue to social distance uh, within our school where possible uh, and within our organization, our classrooms and our hallways. And uh, right now we're trying to finalize our reopening plan. It, uh, we will try to have a draft out to, um, to, the, to the board in the next uh, 48 hours. And at the same token, being able to send that information to our school-based leaders as well to be able to, to, uh, to obtain any type of feedback in order to move forward. But right now, as we stand, we will... I didn't want you to open okay. this. Okay, okay, okay. She's in the okay, thank you. We will have, mass will be optional, but we'll continue to work with our team, Ms. Ms. Brown and her team do a really nice job working with our uh, medical experts to determine in, in, uh, if there's any adjustments that need to be made. As it relates to Esther 3, then I'll, I'll make sure I get Melanie. As, as it relates to, to Esther 3, on June, I think it's around June 18th, sent an email and a communication to the Department of Education asking them, you know, where are our dollars related to the APR? And, we, and one thing we got back from the CFO from the Department of Education is that the Department of Education did ask for a um, extension to that process. Uh, for the third part of the money, which is over $400 million, it would be allocated to Hillsborough County Public Schools. They said that one thing they had to do is be able to create a plan and to be able to send to Department of, the U.S. Department of Education of how those monies will be expended and being able to make amendments in process to show the coordination of all those dollars. Uh, through that, my assumption is that applications are going to have to be extended to school districts and that we're going to have to apply for that money to be able to show a thoughtful plan and concentration. To date, we have not received any kind of further notification of when that amendment will be awarded awarded or any type of application related to Hillsborough, you know, to the state of Florida, being able to say that we are, we agree to the funding and this is our plan for initiatives. Um, on top of that, the uh, Department of Education, uh, Florida Department of Education also said is that they're going to have to get stakeholder input to be able to determine how that money would be inclusive. That was in the communication that was sent with me as well. To date, I haven't seen any forms or opportunity for stakeholder input to be embedded in that process. We do know there's very clear indications from the uh, from the from the federal government related to how these ex this money is supposed to be used, and from our side of it, we are continuing to work with uh, the Wallace Foundation and being a cohort of how they can continue to be think partners in the Council of Great City Schools about how those dollars will be, are expected to be spent and how we can be able to manage that money to be able to create lift within our school district every single day. So right now we are on hold for APR, which is the American Rescue um, Initiative related to funding for in, indirectly it could be called ESSER 3 and uh, looking for more guidance. Um, as the one thing I did ask today from the CFO uh, Department of Education, I asked Ms. Pridgen, you know, where are we related to the second part of funding related to um, ESSER 2 dollars? Because we got a lump sum of 100, over $100 million and there was additional funding, I think around $54 million, that we have not been able to have accessibility to. Mm -hmm. To my understanding through the conversation today, we may be, see some information related to that award by the end of this week mm -hmm. so that we can go move forward to be able to activate those dollars to make sure those dollars are going to children or potentially going to um, uh, support our initiatives and our strategic plan within the school district. And we know that through the board we will have an update, I believe, on July 27th about how workshop about how we plan to seek information and feedback from the board about how ESSER dollars will be implemented within our school district and how we will leverage that to be able to put systems and processes in place, further support academic initiatives, further support mental health initiatives, and, being, uh, and, and further strengthening the core instruction and accelerating uh, learning, especially in the persistently low-performing schools within our school district. I've got one more Great. thing, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Is that is that everything? Is thank you, ma'am. One more thing. I, I I forgot to acknowledge. We have Melanie Hill Anderson here tonight. Melanie, uh, if you'll please uh, stand up. Melanie is uh, one of the. Uh, I will say this. We earlier about a month ago we acknowledged a leader that would go to Tampa Heights and lead the work. The Department of Education, you know, is uh, they they get involved related to leaders in schools for those who can be qualified for this uh, for those roles, and we sent a number of names to well, you can come up, Melanie. What a number of names to the Department of Education through analytics, of who ha has turnaround experience to lead the work within our school district. And, you know, it came back through the nine names that we sent who qualified it. There was two names that they approved. And uh, Mrs. Uh, Melanie Hill Anderson, currently at Bing Elementary School, has been identified as a turnaround expert. 
and will be on uh, moving the work and being able to go to Tampa Heights Elementary to be the new principal. And we thank her for that. She didn't have to do that. We, we've talked to her. She understands the seriousness of being able to move our schools and our persistently low-performing schools. She has criteria. She has proven track record. And we want to thank you and welcome you. And let's give her a round of applause for her work. <laughs> thank you so very much. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I know, and uh, so we'll, we'll look to find a, a new leader to continue her great work at, at Bing. And then please know that Ms. Jennifer West will go back to being a lead in the work for our, our gifted programs in our school district. Jennifer does a, a magnificent job, and, uh, you know, openly in Jennifer's heart, her aspirations eventually, you know, is to get back to a school. So what we'll do is we'll really work in the next year to have success in management so that uh, Ms. West feels very comfortable about putting systems in place for our gifted initiatives and that we can transition back to have someone and getting her back to a school where particularly her heart may be. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. Uh, just a follow-up question with regards to the uh, safety in the COVID. <clears throat> will we be continuing the, uh, the various cleaning uh, services that Corey's uh, have provided, Corey's Culpepper? Um, and, and I think we, we find that the principals are extremely um, <clears throat> complimentary uh, with those procedures. The answer is yes. We'll continue to make certain we provide uh, available PPE for our schools. Um, we actually sent a communication out today through operations to Mr. Farkas's team to be able to remind our principals to to uh, to identify and order whatever they need from a PPE for purposes so that we can get that out from start of day one. Um, there will be some uh, additional adjustments related to our, our safety uh, management, risk management team we're going in to be able to clean. We historically have, uh, you know, I think it was 48 to 72 hours we went in and created the clean, uh, but now we're going to follow CDC guidelines recommendation and, it, and it's a 24-hour stint that we'll be able to put in place. However, we'll still have sanitation stations available within our schools, within our common hallways, within our classrooms that's inclusive of wipes, that's inclusive of masks. Um, we'll make certain we have, uh, you, know, uh, you know, hand sanitizer. Smells a little bit better <laughs> than last year's. We're trying to have uh, accessibility to it. And then being able to have directional um, and notifications through our community, you know, through our hallways and our way we interact to be able to do it openly. We'll continue to have barriers within our lunchroom. We know that it's very hard to social distance during that time. And then if we start to extend that time frame, then, uh, you know, it just embeds the instructional process. But we will absolutely continue to have mitigation strategies within our schools and our staff has done a really nice job being able to help principals help COVID leads we'll continue to have a COVID lead and we'll continue to have Mrs. Sperano who does a really wonderful job holding us accountable holding me accountable to make sure we're implementing the right uh, protocols within place thank you <clears throat> important point uh member Perez did you want to make a comment it's yes, member yes. Perez uh-huh yes thank you so with with the COVID um with the um, PPE going into the fall, I know that the Esther dollars covered it yeah. last year, or we had some, you know, we had some bumps in the road. Um, financially, how are we going to cover that? What does that look like financially for this district? Um, could you speak to that, please? Yes, ma'am. Really good question. From a financial uh, standpoint, we will continue to leverage ESSER dollars. Those are that's what the mentality of those dollars are, are being uh, being used for. So we'll continue to make certain that any PPE or any COVID-related expenses are still connected to uh, the, the the funding coming from the federal government. And you know, we just want to make certain that we're not impacted from our general fund in any way, shape, or form. And we're using those monies in the spirit and the scope as they have been identified. Uh, Member Perez, is that are you satisfied with the answer? Yeah, I just you know the fact that the the COVID um, you know t trying to cover that expense um, PPE and everything else last year really put us in a deficit, and making sure that we don't get there again, you know, um, you know, we just I just want to find out a plan. I want to know what what is happening, especially since we have not received that third. ESSER um, funding as of as of yet, um, you know, I would like to know when when that money is coming in, and if we're using that money to cover this this PPE that we're looking for 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 the for the um, fall, what that's going to look like 
um, and if you could provide that plan for us, you know, um, I would appreciate it. <clears throat> Absolutely. Good question, uh, and we have to keep a very, very an eye on uh, all the monies coming in, and certainly the monies going out. So, thank you, Member Perez, Member Washington, followed by Member Combs. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Davis, are they giving you the lead way to use the money the way you want to? Or are they making stipulations on it? I mean, there's, uh, you know, chair, there's, there's certain criteria that we have to be able to use that funding on. Um, there's a breakout uh, related to. Um, you know, uh, addressing the academic achievement, ad addressing PPE, and also being able to make certain that we use it for, um, you know, course I mean, or for an opportunity for acceleration for students. Um, however, the, the, you know, when it relates to the APR money, we haven't seen any continued criteria, to, uh, you know, as of yet from the Department of Education. So if there's any adjustments that's going to be made, we haven't seen that. We do know what the federal government is allowing us to use it on, any COVID expenses, um, mental health expenses, to be able to, to go and market, uh, to recruit students, to further support our, our teachers with you know, providing them intervention, uh, mental health not only for our, our students but our employees as well, any COVID expenses related to PPE, all those types of things will be able to leverage uh, using that funding. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Member Combs? Um, and I had a question. Is there a timeline? Are they giving us a timeline on how long we have to spend that money? So through the chair, there, there was a timeline of September 2021 that was extended from the Department of Education. Um, however, there was a, a rebuttal letter sent from the federal government from the U.S. Department of Education that said that that deadline may not be able to be um, extended to school districts. Uh, we have yet to hear a response from the Florida Department of Education on that. We have been scrounging trying to, you know, for us, you know, we need that money in so many different ways. So we've got a kind of uh, a plan ready to to expand and extend ESSER $2 um, immediately on a number of uh, eligible expenses. But we're still waiting to hear if that timeline is going to be moved back as it originated from the uh, U.S. Department of Education. And then um, one last comment. Since we're talking about COVID and the guidelines, and I know that you and the team are working on that, to just really think about when the kids are vaccinated, what that looks like, what the quarantine looks like for our middle school, upper middle school, and obviously all our high school students, just to see what those guidelines, seeing what other districts around the state are doing, and obviously around the country as well. And, and through the chair, and I'll make certain that I speak, I say this in a correct manner through uh, Mrs. Brown and, and Mr. McCauley, but those who are, are vaccinated will not, and can prove and validate they're vaccinated, will not have to quarantine. And those are very good clarifications. And, and I think the second part of that question uh, that we, uh, that you mentioned, um, the letter to Corcoran also said the $1,000 paychecks for teachers um, was also remarked by the um, deputy director for the Biden administration that those uh, monies should be going to the high needs children for COVID remediation. Um, those were two of the points, I think, um, and I don't know, uh, Superintendent Davis, if you want to remark on that. But the letter was very important in terms of where our money will go, uh, and we still don't know um, the the amount of monies that we really should get according to the federal authors versus what we're hearing. So, yes, Matthew Chair, one of the questions that I did ask today was related to those fundings, and there there was concerns that the thousand dollars that was extended to teachers, the thousand dollars that were extended to their principals whether or not that took money away from schools. And, and, I, point, and I just openly asked the, the CFO from Florida Department of Education, are we expect, A, what were Hillsborough County dollars used to be able to extend that, those type of notifications or incentives to those teachers and those leaders? The answer to that, they said, is no. And I, and I just want to make certain that the dollars that we're receiving, that we're recouping and obtaining all of the dollars that we were um, originally expected to, to receive so that we can turn key in being able to address the overarching needs of our students. So it was uh, you know, uh, refreshing to hear that the, none of the money that we were expected to get has been taken uh, uh, to the side and, and leveraged for the additional $1,000. Now, that was told to me today, and uh, I guess time will tell if it re related to um, whether or not any adjustments will be made. Thank you for the transparency. <clears throat> okay, board members, uh, we're going to go ahead and hear 0 0.01. It's a public hearing. 
uh, for recommended instructional materials for digital design, comma, fashion, comma, television production, comma, and world languages. And I believe this will be presented, uh, well, let me go ahead and read the formalities. Uh, I will now open the public hearing <clears throat> for the instructional materials adoption process. This is a requirement pursuant to state law and board policy. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to speak about the instructional materials that are recommended for adoption by the board and to provide input to the board. The materials were advertised and have been available for public review. I will now ask Terry Connor, our Deputy Superintendent for Instruction, to present this item. After his presentation, any member of the public may speak to provide input to the board on the proposed instructional materials. Um, Mr. Connor, will you now do us the pleasure of uh, sharing information? Thank you. Good afternoon, school board chair, board members, superintendent, and staff. At this time, the board is conducting a public hearing on instructional materials being recommended for adoption. The list of materials is attached to the agenda item and includes materials for digital design, fashion, television production, and world language. These materials have been reviewed by a district adoption committee and are being recommended for adoption. As required by state statute, a 20-day public review of the recommended materials and a public hearing is required before the vote board can vote for the adoption. The public review requires that the district provide digital access to the recommended materials via the district website. The public review was conducted beginning on June 22nd and ending on July 12th, 2021. The public review this evening is to provide the opportunity for the community members to share comments about these materials with the board. The board does not need to take action at this time, but will be asked to vote at the next regularly scheduled board meeting on July 27, 2021. At this time, you may call for public comments. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Connor. Do we have anyone signed up to speak for the public hearing on the adoption of instructional materials? Seeing none, uh, I will now close the public hearing. Let's go ahead right now and get into the discussion agenda, and I believe we're at 301, discussion agenda. <clears throat> this uh, 301, mental health plan for the use of mental health assistance allocation and Superintendent Davis will highlight this item. Uh, Member Vaughn, you pulled the item, so we'll ask you to ask the question or comment. I also have a comment. Um, Superintendent Davis. Yes, Mayor, the Chair. 301, this is our mental health plan, uh, you know, that we received money from the Department of Education. This was originated after 2018, the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas School Safety Act, in which started putting in a number of dollars into to school districts to truly help from a mental health perspective. So we are required annually to bring this plan to the board to be able to identify initiatives, targets, and also objectives. And what this does is this plan is we get around $8.7 million to our school district, in which around 984,000 of those dollars go to charter school, which puts us around $7.7 .7 million budget to be able to address and deliver a high quality mental health assistance within our school district to be able to, to look at evidence-based uh, materials, content, to look at interventions, to be able to treat students, and at the same token, to be able to have recovery services. We go further on to be able to use it in this plan to have, provide ongoing professional development to our teachers for early detecting and responding to mental health um, issues that students may uh, be, uh, you know, struggling with. And we look at being able to, uh, to address you know, risk factors, being able to train on youth mental health first aid, trauma-informed, and at the same token being able to help with suicide in any way, shape, or form. What this does is allow us to have um, uh, a tier to curriculum to to help us to to provide ongoing uh, accessibility to students for mental health awareness for positive behavior support and also being able to adopt and implement social emotional learning curriculums within our school district this is also a way for us to show how we have greater alignment with our community members within our school district related to bay care also looking at Tampa Bay Crisis, the Department of Children and Families, which is ongoing um, uh, supports for us to further help our students and definitely those in need within our school district. 
<clears throat> Thank you, Su Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second to approve item 301. I have a motion by Member Vaughn, a second by, uh, let's take me off this, uh, Member Perez. And at this time, will there be discussion? Member Vaughn, you, are, you pulled the item. Thank you, Chairwoman Gray. Um, first of all, thank you, Ms. Brown, for sitting with me uh, regarding this item and spending a lot of time answering my questions about this. Um, some items I pull because I have questions and some I just want to highlight, and I'm really glad to see that a lot of the funds are actually being allocated to staff and personnel and people, you know, people <laughs> who are going to interact with our, our students and make sure that they're providing the mental health. So I just encourage people, if they're curious about how this breakdown is, since we have attached it to the agenda item, to go to the agenda item and specifically look at pages 9 and um, 10, because they do a really nice job of, of breaking down how we plan to spend this money. Um, and I just, I, again, I appreciate that we're spending it um, on staff. I know that, unfortunately, this is a, a yearly um a yearly thing that the state may not renew. So as far as I understand, we have um, a set contracts with many of these employees where for some reason this money is no longer made available by the state. They know that and they'll transition to somewhere else. But again, I'm just glad to see that this is really helping to employ people in our district and put people in front of our students who need it the most. So that's just what I want to say on that. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Perez? Member Perez, I'm sorry. Did you want to yes, remove? I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Unmute myself. So you know, as as we understand, because of Marjorie Stoneman, uh, mental health, the mental health for our students was really, really highlighted in 2018 and and brought to the surface. But I have a question about this. Um, as we can see, you know, it it, it demonstrates that our um, charter schools receive part of this money. What happens when the charter schools do not um, have the staff for the students. Do they still receive this money and what do they do with the money when they don't have the staff and provide the mental health services for the students? Yes, ma'am, the chair. They still, they do get their portion of their dollars, but they are expected to be able to submit a plan as well that really identifies the coordination of every dollar and every cent. Um, if they do not use their dollars, my understanding that, 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 that additional dollars will go back to the state. However, but they have to be able to have an approved plan uh, that we review in the same token the Department of Education reviews as well. Okay. Member Price? <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah, I, we, oh. we did notice that um, the charter schools that we, we reviewed, um, a few of them did not have mental health services for their students. Okay, thank you, Member Perez. Uh, my question, and it might have to go to um, Ms. Brown, uh, when we look at page three, <clears throat> and I know we went over this, but I think it, it, it does bear remarking on, um, we have on this Stoneman-Douglas uh, uh, agreement, so to speak, uh, chronically violent or disruptive, second, expelled due to possession of a firearm, third, students who have made threats against the school, but I do not know why uh, and this can be asked also with uh, another program that we'll get into later, why we are not including students, children who have the ACE, the Adverse Childhood Experiences. Uh, when we look at COVID, we know that children have had uh, many cases of ACE, uh, abuse, neglect, physical um, situations like hunger. Uh, substance abuse in the family. There are just so many, um, so many crises, traumatic crises that have occurred and are definitely coming to light because of COVID. Why we haven't delineated the students, the children of, of all of these maladies. And uh, Ms. Brown, I know that we did, with this was already agreed in 2018, the Sto uh, Marjorie Stoneman, we know that, but can you remark, because this is gonna come out again on any mental health avenue we discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gray. I appreciate that comment because yes, adverse childhood, um, incidents and, and experiences really do impact our children and it affects their mental health. 
And so we do want to address it. What you see stated on page three is simply the requirements by the state. Mm -hmm. We do go beyond that. So whenever we recognize that a student has struggled or has experienced some adverse events in their lives, we do address that. And so these are also why we partner with agencies like DACO and we partner with Success for Students and for Kids and Families because they address those needs that, that, um, that are impacting students that have had negative experiences. So we absolutely address that. It's just that in this particular document, this is what the state requires. And this is a minimum. And we do go beyond that. And that's good to know, and I did share with uh, Ms. Bays also, because the vocabulary has to be more inclusive of, uh, of the diagnostic, uh, the trauma, children with trauma. So that's the point I wanted to make, and I thank you. Uh, board members, um, we need a motion. Uh, excuse me, we have our motion. We need to, uh, well, we have a motion by Member Washington, second by Member Combs. Please vote when your lights are on. <clears throat> and it's uh, yay for everyone. Um, and Member um, Perez, is that a yes? Okay, thank you. All right, moving on, we'll go to the next agenda item, and this revolves around 402. And there he is. Uh, thank you, Superintendent uh, <laughs> Davis. We're going to go ahead and ask you to highlight the student teacher partnership affiliation agreement between Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University, FAMU, Tallahassee, Florida, and Hillsborough County Public Schools. And a uh, member uh, Vaughn pulled this item. Mr. Davis, Superintendent Davis, highlight. Yes, ma'am. This is a, a, a way and a strategy to be able to grow a longer, stronger bench of future educators within Hillsborough County. So being able to have and develop a partnership with FAMU who and create a pathway for their students to complete their student teaching internships in our district is exactly what we're looking for. We continue to have that pathway with, with local universities and colleges, but we're trying to continue to expand this, and we want to be able to get individuals excited about this process. We openly have to do a better job creating these pathways in our high school and starting, you know, getting students exposed internally at an earlier age. But this is just a, a, a great initiative and, and hats off to Monica Torado for spearheading this effort. She's not here today, but um, this is another, uh, you know, a good movement to being able to build future educators within Hillsborough County. Thank you. Um, I need a motion and a second to approve item C402. I have a motion by Member Washington. I have a second by Member Vaughn. Any discussion? Um, Member Vaughn will be first. Member Vaughn. Thank you, um, Chairwoman Gray. Uh, again, this was, I just wanted to do a quick highlight. I know that we spend a lot of time talking about uh, the school to prison pipeline, and one of part of the conversation is how do we get reflective staff members, teachers in our schools that look like the students in our schools. So by partner with a, pr partnering with a traditional black college and university, I think is really important, and I just wanted to highlight this relationship to show that we are focusing on making sure that we have diversity in our classrooms. <clears throat> Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Washington? All I can say is great. This is, this is a great move to be with the historical black colleges and universities to have FAMU. I know my wife is real happy about this. <laughs> but it's a great move because we need diversity in the schools. And, and, and I, really, I really appreciate this. This is a great move. I really do. Yeah. Thank and, you. And we also have that, um, Member Washington, in our African American Forum we have the FAMU involvement with teacher development That's and right, recruitment. Exactly so they're, right. Yeah, they're very vigorous and uh, intentional for diversity. And this is, you know, and this is something we got to face reality. We got to put people in front of people who look like them. I mean, that's important. Uh, you know, I was fortunate because I went to all black schools, so it wasn't a problem. And I said, but now we just got, because I don't think our, <clears throat> our student population reflects instructors in, the, in Hillsborough County Public Schools. So this will be a great help and a great deal, and hopefully we'll be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Member Washington. Uh, board members, please vote when your lights are on. Okay, all in favor, and Member Perez, thank you. Okay, board members, 501, Student Code of Conduct. Um, Superintendent Davis, if you will highlight this item. 
and I had just a little bit of a comment. Yes, ma'am. So this is a student code of conduct to inform our students and parents of their rights and responsibilities and how they will interact in a positive manner and related to details within within our school district. Our, our student conduct, code of conduct uh, aligns with state and federal um, policies along with Hillsborough County public schools policies and procedures and just truly gets to a point that really defines uh, overall interaction within our school district. This is all about prevention and intervention to be able to make certain that we focus on creating a culture of respect and also a culture of trust, collaboration, and equity within our school district. Um, we've done a really nice job this year uh, of working and expanding our task force to be able to address and interact with this code of conduct and to be able to make sure it is truly progressive to be able to further support our schools and further support our students and protect the working conditions of our adults as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, if I can just follow up, uh, and let me go ahead and be in the uh, correct queue before I follow up. Uh, board members, I need a motion and a second. I have a motion by Member Combs and a second by Member Washington. Any discussion? So, uh, okay, let me go ahead and just say one thing here. <laughs> first off, first off, I wanted to thank the uh, Student Code of Conduct Committee. Uh, they re have responded uh, with great affirmation with, uh, and I just gave this term, restorative justice for our students. So when you adopt programs such as the Leader in Me or the PBIS, Positive uh, Behavior Incentive Support System from USF, uh, what you're really doing, and this goes to Member Washington and to your, um, your concerns, uh, the disproportionality of suspension for black students. When we face it head on with strategies that will develop or mitigate the absolute direct suspension rate and give the children strategies to prevent themselves from getting into the into that pipeline uh, I, I definitely think with state attorney Andrew Warren uh, we're trying to make sure that we are not in that paragraph where we automatically suspend students so I just wanted to say thank you because there is a deliberate intentionality and I think you're all meeting with the sunshine what's the name the, the, this, Ms. Bays, go ahead. And, are you meeting with them? Yes, we're continuously meeting with both the NAACP and the Sunshine Coalition. And, and are they recognizing what you all are doing? And is it an, an they are, and they've been very supportive. And they've had members on the committee as well. So we've taken several of their recommendations to be inclusive uh, in the Student Code of Conduct. And I do hope that they will find a time that they can come to the podium and share their comments because we want to hear that what we're doing is not only, you know, yay, we're doing it, but it's working. So uh, that's what I wanted to say, that, that we openly are, are committed to restorative justice. And I thank you for your work and Joshua Crystal and Katrina Hudson um, for handling this. Board up, oh, we have a comment. Um, Board Member Washington? Yes, <laughs> one comment. Ms. Bayes, I want to thank you, too, because being a former administrator, some of the problems we have is disrespect. That's one of the largest ones that we have because what, who defined disrespect? It's in the eye of the beholder. So that was, I think that was really good when y'all had taken that disrespect. I just want to thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Member Washington. Uh, board members, please vote when your lights are on. All in favor and Member Perez. Okay, I, I raised your hand for you. <laughs> thank you, Member Perez. Okay, let's go to the next agenda item. Uh, this is 601, adoption and purchase of recommended instructional materials for elementary art, comma, elementary music, comma, middle and high school developmental language arts and middle and high school English language development. Superintendent Davis, uh, if you'll make the highlight, and I have two board members that pulled the item, Member Vaughn and Member Combs. Um, Superintendent Davis? Yes, ma'am. As you know, we're on an adoption cycle for certain content and materials within our school district. And uh, right now, elementary art, elementary music, middle high school developmental language arts, and also middle high school English language arts development, our materials are on the, the adoption process. We always go and, and leverage the, the knowledge of our, our teachers within our school district. They have identified core cur curriculums they want to be able to use and implement or supplemental within our, within our district. And 
these are what we bring into tonight. It's a $1.8 million to be expended. This, this dollar amount will be leveraged through instructional material categorical dollars, which the Department of Education gives us dollars to purchase materials. And this will be able to, to use those dollars to be able to implement and accept and embrace the recommendations of our teachers within our schools. Thank you, Superintendent Davis, Member Vaughn, and Member Combs. Member Vaughn, would you like to make a uh, remark? I'll, I'll let Member Combs go first since I, I get to speak often, if you don't mind. Okay, well, we're yeah. not going to flip a coin, so we'll have you, Member My Combs. questions were answered on this, so I pulled it, and then my questions were answered, so I don't have any further questions on that. Thank you. Thank you, Member Combs. Member Vaughn? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I wanted to use this as an opportunity. We already had a public com a public hearing on this in the last meeting. Um, so uh, members of the community do have an opportunity to come during these adoption process and ask questions and engage as well. So we just had another one today. So I just wanted to highlight that that we did have a public hearing on this. Um, there's also a committee, right? That's that's put together in order for this adoption process. I just wanted to make sure the public knew that this is also a committee that's gone through the process of adopting this. Um, the question that I think I wasn't able to get answered was, um, will this only be, is this adoption only until the new standards come out? Do the new standards also um, affect the, uh, the art and the music, or are those just academic? So currently, we're only adopting uh, math and ELA for the best standards, and then we'll also be updating the civic standards uh, in the next couple of years. So how long do we uh, expect to utilize this adoption for these materials specifically? So specifically with art and music, we won't see at least for another four years on the adoption cycle now. Now, the state can change that, but we're, we have four years until we reach that adoption cycle. Okay. Um, with our English language development courses, they are not necessarily on an adoption cycle, but we typically do that with ELA. Uh, and so we will, we just did that this year. So we're continuing that process with, with these books as well. Okay. I think a lot of people see the price tag and they want to make sure that this is something that we're going to utilize for hopefully, unless you yeah, say we, with the state, we at least have these four years. Yeah, four years. Okay. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Member Vaughn. Member Perez? Okay. Nothing? Okay. All right. So please vote when your lights are on. Madam Chair, we need a motion first. I thought we had a... According to Marita, we don't have a motion, so... Oh, we do? oh, okay. I need a motion and a second. I have a motion by Member Washington and second by Member Combs. Please vote when your lights are on. Okay, all in favor, and Member Perez? Uh, okay, thank you. All right, we're going to move on. 603, <clears throat> purchase of adopted instructional materials for middle and secondary reading gap year 2021 to 2022. Superintendent Davis will highlight. Member Combs pulled the item, so Superintendent Davis. Yes, ma'am. As you know, last month we identified Tier 1 for intensive reading for students in the grades of 6 through 12 to be able to address uh, students who are Level 1 and Level 2, identified on the Florida Department uh, Education Accountability FSA system. Uh, so this is a supplemental material that was originally adopted in 2018 within, within Hillsborough County as an additional supplemental material to further address Tier 2 and Tier 3 services uh, for our students. What, the, what, um, what this initiative does, it really comes on board of Brightfish Learning to further support um, individual, in prescribing in individual instruction for our students that is truly focused on uh, foundational skills uh, through a word recognition, phrases, and at the same time, a pair, uh, you know, paragraph fluency, vocabulary, all those are elements to make sure that children have a comprehensive understanding and interaction with text. Um, what we do is we know that this is a, a platform that's supposed to be used from a digital perspective from 45 to 60 minutes per week. Mm -hmm. And also uh, we'll be using reading categorical funding, which is around $200,000 to be able to create this purchase. And the reading categoricals is all about really strengthening the reading process. And this is uh, another um, opportunity as a gap year 
to continue to help us with the intensive reading process. Because the following year, we'll be able to look at additional resources and determine whether or not Brightfish aligns and whether or not it, it truly is moving the needle. Because when this was adopted in July 2018, we haven't had really analytical data to determine the overall return on investment related to FS FSA. Anything, Tracy? Okay. <laughs> He, he done good, right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I got that. He's getting a really good, job. good at this. Yay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, I need a motion and a second. I have a motion by Member Combs, a second by Member Washington, uh, and we'll have our comment at this time. Member Combs? Um, I, my question is not necessarily about Brightfish, but it's in, in general regarding our, our online programs. Oh. So I really would like to see or request to see, you know, every online program that is being utilized in every school and maybe a three or five years prior, the use of it, the cost of it. I really want an analysis of all these online programs. And I know that kids are learning often online, but you know, we all know as educators that you, you can't, the love of learning comes through a book or through a teacher. I mean, that's how we really get that. And we realize that, and there is a need for online programs. I'm not saying there's not. I just feel like we are purchasing a lot of programs. What are we gonna use? What are we not using? And I think it's often a little skewed when you see a pre-test and post-test because there's teaching going on in between that. So that is not always like indicative of how well a child is doing in that program. So what I'd like to request you know, from you, Superintendent, and from um, Academic Services is to start thinking now and looking back at the prior before you came on board and as you come on board to really analyze each of these programs. Are kids using them in the classroom? How often in the classroom are they using outside the classroom and the kids who are not using outside the classroom is it because they don't have uh, availability of computers what do we need to do that because I think ideally what we'd love to see is some of these online programs being used before school or after school and then possibly once in a while during the classroom but during classroom it really should be focused on whole group instruction and also just you know that small group instruction that we're using so as I see more and more programs that's my concern because I think um, especially for young boys you know I think we we need things that are more hands-on and computers and, and things that don't engage kids, we kind of lose children that way. So that was kind of my question and my comment. Well said. Um, Member Combs, Member Vaughn. Thank you. Um, I did not pull this item, however, I have a similar comments to Member Combs. Bless you, whoever that was. Um, because I do, I am concerned about how many computer software programs we're purchasing. Um, you know, just every million that we spend on every computer software program could equal, you know, 15 to 20 employees, staff members in the classroom. Um, for this one specifically, um, I know that it's a gap year, so we're only anticipating to, to use this for one year um, because of the shortage between what the state had decided and what we had adopted. Um, I guess my question is, what's after this? when this gap year is done, are we no longer utilizing this program in the same way? Are we supplementing something as opposed to this? Like what's after the gap would be my question. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, Tracy. So um, after the gap year, um, as part of our adoption process, our adoption committee, because the services are intensive reading classes, our adoption committee hasn't finished adopting. They left off last year looking at some of the materials, knowing that additional materials would be added on. Um, in particular with our new standards, the best standards, they actually have specifically the foundational skills addressed in them called out as supposed to be taught to our tier two and tier three students that are enrolled in these um, intensive reading courses. So part of the role of our adoption committee and our secondary supervisors is going to be to really take a look at the materials that are available and ensure that they're built in so that we don't have to have, you know, here's a, fi a filler, so to speak, or something to cover those foundational skills for those students that are needed. So that's our plan moving forward. Um, the adoption committee for the future years will be meeting starting in September. Like I said, we, we already have a committee created and they'll continue their work to review different options based on the state's most updated list to ensure that there is just that, that balance of um, you know technology, which, which is important, but also the in, um, direct instruction and the teacher-led instruction that aligns to those foundational skills called out in VAST. I don't know if I answered your question. So does that mean we're not going to see a renewal of this program next year? 
I can't say for sure that we will or won't. Again, that's a decision that the, you know, the adoption committee can certainly include Brightfish as part of, you know, one of their choices, um, you know, in terms of based on what they think, and they can put it out to teachers to vote. So I can't say for certainty, no, we'll never see it again. I can't say for certainty, yep, we're going to see it for sure, because it does have to follow the process um, in terms of that. Um, in terms of Brightfish itself, does it align itself with the foundational skills standards that are listed in the best? Yes, it does. Um, it in particular focuses on the vocabulary and in the word analysis. It focuses on fluency, which is often hard to measure, especially in our secondary students that struggle reading out loud and getting that, you know, that raw data from kids. I mean, you know, there's kids that have historically not been successful in that area. So this program does present that. Um, so it definitely has its strengths. It is truly an instructive-based program. It is not an assessment program. Well, obviously, it has built-in assessment. I mean, you know, it's the only way you can monitor how kids are doing. It truly is more instructional. But in terms of will we see it in the future, I, I can't answer that until the adoption committee finalizes their process. Right now we're just looking out just for this coming year. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Perez? My concern, my concern is that there's a lot of uh, students that um, – well, as we learned when COVID hit, that there's a lot of students that do not have access to computers um, at home. And when we provided them with a computer to take home, a lot of these students didn't even know how to turn it on, let alone what, what to do with the computer. Um, and also, you know, we take for granted that a lot of this, we say, oh, you know, the students all, all have an iPhone, or we, we take for granted that a lot of students do not. They don't have accessibility to any technology once they leave our schools. So when we're talking about programs to help our students read, they already are at a deficit because they're, they don't have, first of all, technology. And then they're already behind in their reading. For me, um, Putting more programs in front of our kids to frustrate them is not the answer. Um, you know, for me, it really is getting them the instruction that they need um, with a with a teacher. You know, a face-to-face -face, um, instruction. To be honest with you, I don't think more technology is the answer. Um, I think. It's the gap that we're seeing right now with our students and putting more technology in front of them. As we see, it's not, it's, it's, it's just not gonna help them. I'm gonna be honest with you and that's where I stand with this. Thank you, Member Perez. And what we're hearing is um, more or less a request, if I can use the word audit on our online programs. Um, I, I will also be a devil's advocate. I'm a teacher, so I can say this safely. The, um, there is, uh, with any program, as we know, a learning curve. So uh, when we look at Ingenuity, uh, Canvas is a good example, Chief 3000. Teachers uh, with COVID uh, were very stressed, and to learn all those programs and to really use them with full fidelity was a challenge, and it is a challenge. So should we give teachers an extra year to get more comfortable? That's a, a thought that we may want to share. Also, digital programs, and I'm uh, some of us of my age are, you know, the, it's, it's not a comfortable uh, fit because, um, you know, teaching is the best fit being right in front of the students, and I think we all know this, but the reality is COVID has hit us and hit us hard and it may not go away. And if we don't have immediate resources for the children in terms of what they can have in front of them, then we are stifling the possibility of even more. And, a, and an more education an example is the, uh, let me make sure I pronounce it, Nuzuela. Uh, Ms. Brown, how do you pronounce it? Nuzella. Nuzella. Sounds like that nut mix, right? Yeah, nut <laughs> Nuzella. I mean, you're combining social-emotional learning. Well, the first thing you would say is, well, how can you do digital and, and put social-emotional learning with a digital concept? You know, that's, that doesn't make sense. But what she is going to tell you, and uh, Su Superintendent Davis, is it's first teacher first. It's teacher first. And only the digital is used as an amenity. 
So when we talk about, and I'm not, you know, you have to know I'm not a big digital person, period. But when there is the reality of a virus that may transfer itself into another way, we don't know, we have to be prepared that where where, where are we going to be with the teaching uh, part? What if the teachers are quarantined? What if the kids are quarantined? Da, 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 da. Um, but Superintendent Davis, I think it's well valued from this board that we do have an audit sure. that we are very sensitive now because we're getting all these board and for, please appreciate uh, we're, we're seeing all these high cost digital programs and we're good old fashioned teacher folks excuse me, um, uh, Member uh, Washington, but you uh, you are from the same, you know, blend that I came from. We know the good old-fashioned way. So this is not to say teachers first. That's not to say that at all. But if we don't have balance, if we have too much of one and not enough of the other, or certainly the digital, that needs to be addressed. It, Superintendent Davis, would you comment? Yes, ma'am. You know, I always say this. Technology would never replace a, a great teacher. We, we know that teachers need to be in front of our students. We also need to understand where our students are from a digital native perspective and their interaction with online platforms. And we also need to be able to, to be sophisticated enough to offer programmatic initiatives that students can access before, during, and after school and have independent learning to allow them to grow. Um, you know, when you look at, uh, you know, I read, uh, Achieve was here before I got here. I read was here before I got here. And we, you know, when you look at Edgenuity, Edgenuity is a significant, you know, um, platform that is needed for course recovery. At the same time, it really helped us through e-learning. So when we look at all these, um, you know, initiatives, we know that they're supplemental to our educators. We will never replace it. But teachers have you know continue to be able to leverage these resources to be able to help children we need independent practice differentiated practice for students and not teachers have all the time to be able to do that to differentiate to have small group to have independent practice during the instructional frameworks and these resources really really continue to help um, coordinate that uh, small group instruction, create the space for teachers to pull small groups with students to allow students to have that independent practice. Openly, you look, if you look at, and you know, all of these initiatives are used not only throughout the state, but, but throughout the nation as well. Do we agree that we need to do an audit to show the progression of it? Absolutely. We also need to do an audit every year to determine the overall average value. A Chi 3000 I ready came in front of our cabinet members to defend what they demonstrated within our school district this year. They have to defend it. And if they can't show progression, our role and responsibility is not to bring it back to the board. We have to protect our integrity of our classrooms and the initiatives that we bring forth as a supplement of material. So making certain that return on investment takes place every day. We'll, we'll get that information to your board, to each of you, so you can interact with it and we can make informed decisions. I think it's a good ask. It's an excellent ask, and thank you for that uh, explanation. And, and just as a follow-up, uh, another example of a digital program that fits the need as a resource was the SIPS, the phonics program. We all know when we had the phonics, when, when did we put that out? I think it was two years ago. We had such success. This year. This year. Well, uh, yeah, but we had nine schools that oh, tried yeah. it first. Absolutely. You know. And it was hugely successful. Absolutely. So there is an example of a digital program, but it's used as a resource, and uh, teachers can uh, definitely have results if they use it in conjunction. You know, all the time we know that every, even I ready, a teacher is always in charge of the time they put a child on that computer. And that's why we have supervisors to check that the teachers are not putting the child in front of the computer the entire period of time. So, but again, you're going to get the audit and I think we, we uh, those comments are uh, very well said and meaningful. Uh, and let's go ahead and take a vote. Oh, M Member Price, did you wanna go ahead and say another comment? Yeah. I. Oh. I, I I'm just, I just, I'm just having a problem with this, because in District Five, the schools are, you know, not doing well. 
activity. And if these programs were working and supporting our children, then the grades at District 5 would be demonstrating that. And I'm just, I just have a problem with this. I do. You know, in District 5, the, the, the schools are, you know, our lower economic um, area. And, you know, right there, that should, that should be a demonstration of how these work or don't work. You know, the audit should be conducted right there in this yeah. District 5. Um, where a lot of our children do not have access to technology, where our, a lot of our, our students and families do not have access to the internet, um, you know, and, you know, their grades, just their grades right there in that area demonstrate that a lot of this technology, a lot of this access to, um, you know, the, the, these, these, it just doesn't work. I'm, I'm just saying it may work in other areas here in Hillsborough County, but the areas that really need it, our students that really need it, these programs do not work for them. And these are the students that are being left behind. Just saying. Sorry. Thank you, Member Perez. Uh, Member, Member Vaughn and then Member Washington. Thank you, um, Member um, Chairwoman Gray. I, I do think that there is a place for, I mean, we are adapting. We are going to be a technological society. We need our students to understand how to use technology. So I don't think anyone is saying that there's no place for computer programs in education. I think the concern that is valid is number one I mean we've talked openly about how we have financially limited resources and so I think the concern is is we were a district flush with cash and we could afford to use these computer programs sup as supplements without compromising spending any money on personnel if we didn't have to kind of make a Sophie's choice as far as education is concerned then it wouldn't be a, a sticking point I think the the challenge is is that we have to stay within our financial means and I think what I'm hearing from board members, a majority of them that are here right now, is if we have to make a choice between prioritizing actual um, teacher engagement where we have, you know, teachers who are leading the lessons, who are engaging the students, or using computer programs to supplement that because we don't have enough time of the day, enough resources, and we're shortchanging our students, it doesn't become a supplement, it becomes in lieu of. So I think if we were in a district, you know, again, where we had enough time and we had enough resources to buy a, a million computer programs and use them as supplements, that's fantastic. Um, I think the concern is that they become in lieu of direct instruction. Um, and we had a teacher here tonight who talked about feeling like they had to put their student on achieve so much throughout the day and that it wasn't a supplement that was enhancing or using um, directing their instruction it was more in lieu of another thing I have to sit the kid on another 15 minutes of I ready another 15 minutes of achieve 3000 and then it becomes a struggle within the teachers day of all that they have to do making sure that they get their student in front of a computer program enough time to justify the existence so I think it's important that we're having this discussion I don't want it to to come off as that, you know, me personally or other board members are saying there's not a place, but I think we have to be realistic about the choices that we're making. I think another piece of the conversation that might be important is talking about whether or not we have the flexibility to use these funds, because in talking with Dr. Brown, you know, there was a discussion about whether or not the state earmarks much of the spending only to be used in that way. So I think that's another thing we have to have a robust discussion about is how much of this is our d direction, our decision, or how much of this is being guided by the state who really wants to, to utilize these programs. So those were kind of my thoughts on it. Thank, Thank you. you. Member Vaughn, Member Washington, and then we're going to vote. Okay. Um, maybe I'm overlooking something here. Uh, is there any percentage of the success rate, how kids are improving or what? Yes, Treasurer the Chair. This is, uh, you know, as you, this was adopted in July 2018. So 2018-2019 uh, school year, there was no, uh, th there was no information related to um, our going into uh, a coordination of uh, school years of analytics. I mean, systemically, the last three years. So the last in 1920, there's no data. 
So 1820, uh, we can make sure we can get that data to you. We do see that uh, when you look at beginning of the year, mid-year, we do see the, uh, you know, close to 8,700 students did make an increase related to um, moving the needle in the comprehensive assessments. But, um, Mr. Connor, we, we can get that data. Or is there any yeah, additional? I don't have a percentage. I need to have yeah. So we have 42% of the students. Now, this data is coming from within the program. So students would move from yeah. one instructional level up to the next instructional level. So based on the data within the program and the usage that students have this, this year, 42% of students made increases and 40% maintained their instructional levels. So we do see, remember, the students who use this program are your middle school and high school students in intensive reading. So they're very struggling readers. So it provides the foundational skills that they need to get more confident and being able to comprehend text. And so this program helps with those foundational skills. And as they move instructional levels within the program, they're building their comprehension along the way. Now, will they be proficient on the FSA? Maybe not. But again, we want to see the growth out of these students. These students, a lot of students in this particular bucket have been level one, level two students their whole career since the third grade. And they may be in 10th grade now. They're working through this program because it is very difficult sometimes for teachers to teach an intensive reading teacher who has to teach standards as well as now go back and teach foundational skills to a class of 20 to 25 10th graders. So this program, when used as it's intended with the instructional frameworks that we've created for intensive reading, a teacher can teach the standards for the 10th grade FSA as well as provide independent practice for students to do that foundational skills work and then conference with the teacher along the way to make sure they're making that progress. So within the program, to answer your question, 42% of the students have made increases mm -hmm. while 40 have maintained. But again, this is in a year of COVID. So we want, to, we want to continue to look through this one additional year as we get to the adoption for intensive reading. <clears throat> so I'm looking at District 5. We have any, any uh, data? I do, not have, I do not have breakout by districts on, on Brightfish, but we can provide that to you. Okay, I'd like to have it. Thank yep. you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Member Washington, Member Combs, and then we're going to vote. Um, and just one last comment. I just want to make sure that people know I, I, I am going to vote for this because I have heard from teachers that they do find it successful, and it is not a huge price tag for compared to some of the other online programs. I think we've got to comparatively look at what the online programs are, the cost of them overall, who we're targeting, what we're targeting. I think it, if we break it down and really look at it, I think it's going to be easier to see which students we're targeting, what we're doing. And obviously, as we know, it, it, you know, if I have millions of dollars, what would I spend it on? Li you know, we've talked about libraries and schools, you know, different leveled readers. I mean, I mean, I read a book with a child last week and I've been thinking about it all week, right? Those are the things that really drive reading. And how do we get kids to compete again? I say this very often. There's pro, it, competition, especially with elementary school children, to read books and all of that. That's really what drives kids to read. So I'm not going to not vote for it. I just want the awareness of where are we going and how many online programs do we need. And at the end of the day, I think teachers go into teaching because they love children and they love the art of teaching because teaching is truly an art. And if teachers feel like every minute is squared away on what they have to do, what online program, we're not going to get those passionate teachers anymore. And I think it's very important that we keep those teachers because that's why they go into teaching, right? And that's what drives children to move levels. Thank you, Member Combs. Well said. Um, board members, please vote when your lights are on. Okay, it's uh, unanimous. Oh, sorry. Um, one dissenting vote would be from Member Perez. Thank you, board members. It passes. Next will be Item 605, purchase of curriculum and industri uh, industry certification testing vouchers from certification partners, LLC. Uh, Superintendent Davis will highlight and Member Vaughn will ask a question or make a comment. 
Superintendent Davis. Yes, ma'am. This is for uh, to continue to expand our accessibility to CTA testing through vouchers for our, our students within our, within our pathways and our programs. These are certification partnership curriculums and vouchers that have been integrated in curriculum related to, uh, to our uh, career technical education courses. And as we know that uh, last year we had around 4,600 plus students being able to take uh, CTE vouchers to be able to obtain their certification. And this year as we continue to expand our initiatives for our students, we will grow that by 10%, moving close to over 5,000 of our testing vouchers for our students within, within our pathways. This is all for certified internet web. This is all directly linked to web foundations, JavaScripts, and at the same token looking at uh, data analysis. So this will be taken over for the Microsoft bundles that we currently offer and just being able to use and leverage the money from our uh, Carl D. Perkins secondary grant to be able to purchase these vouchers for our students through CTE. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. Uh, Member Vaughn? Thank you, Chairwoman Gray. Um, you know, originally I had some questions about this, and um, then you answered them. Thank you very much. And I just wanted to kind of leave it because I think it is really Member important. Vaughn, I'm so oh. sorry. I forgot to do the uh, motion. So I need a motion before we start discussing. I need a motion and a second. I have a motion by Member Washington and a member uh, motion by Member Combs. Okie doke. Um, Member Vaughn. Continue. So at this point, thank you. I think it's just important that we highlight it um, that there, uh, you know, these tests can be expensive. There's something that could rack up. They could potentially be a barrier from a student taking the course and then not having the money to afford to take the test. So I think the fact that you know we make an effort to get these vouchers every year and utilize them, and, and I know we've been told that we, the t the student can even take the test more than once <laughs> if needed with these vouchers, and that we you know are doing everything that we can to provide access so that students who take these classes can then afford to take the test and take the test and walk away with the certification. So I just thought it was important that we highlight that. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Please vote when your lights are on. All in favor, uh, and again, just to be remindful, uh, mindful that Member Snively and Member Hahn are not here. Thank you, board members. Uh, we're going to now the 606 Ingenuity, the purchase of Ingenuity virtual instruction curriculum for grades 6 through 12 from Ingenuity. Superintendent Davis will highlight. Yes, Madam Chair, this is a, uh, a, a virtual instructional curriculum for grades 6 through 12. We know that some of our students may not uh, may master standards at different time in, in their high school or their middle school career. So, you know, from our standpoint, from an, from an educator openly, you know, we want to make certain we can continue to provide accessibility to students to either re recover a grade or recover a course. And for middle schools and high schools and K-8s, this is allows our students for, um, for credit recovery licenses. And then if you look at our ESE centers as well and our career centers and DJJ sites, this will act as a comprehensive suite of licensures of, of courses within um, for regular credits. You know, we had a, you know, over uh, 5,700 credits that were recovered this, this past year. And um, we have over 2,000 students that are still in progress for recovering these courses. And this just says a lot. And this, allow, this type of initiative just truly allows our, you know, our students to continue on their pathway through their academic histories, to stay on track with their cohort to graduate. And this initiative is definitely needed to be able to help our students can continue to, um, to really be exposed to re relevant activities, to be able to have adaptable, formative, and summative assessments, and get real-time feedback through Edgenuity. <clears throat> Mr. Connor, anything? Board members, I need a motion and a second. I have a motion by Member Combs, a second by Member Washington. Uh, any discussion besides myself? So I have discussion from Member Vaughn, then Member Combs, and then uh, Member Gray will say something. Thank you, Member Gray. Um, as we're having a discussion, I know we had some speakers here tonight who have some concerns about this computer program. Um, I have actually um, seen it and uh, gone into uh, my career center and seen seen the use of it. Um, and I am kind of torn on it because I do think that it does have some value. Um, I think the concern that I'm hearing from a lot of constituents is that it's being used in isolation, and that's where the concern comes in. I think, again, this is a conversation of if this is something that we're using 
with robust direct instruction to make sure that we're supporting students, that we're giving them options for um, recovery with credits, that that is a great tool. I think the concern comes into play once again that this is in, in our in, when we're talking about our um, you know our DJJ. Um, areas of instruction or if we're talking about our career centers or specifically when our ta we're talking about our ESE students because that's where I heard a lot of concern come from that the data on this and, and to be using this in lieu of making sure that there's direct instructions with our most vulnerable students especially when we talk about the school to prison pipeline is where this has come into play so you know I just want to make clear that you know if I vote on this yes tonight it would be with the understanding that we're not using this in isolation and what we're doing is making sure that we're being aggressive to support our students in our career centers and the other areas and our ESE students, that this isn't the only tool that we're using to, to supplement any kind of engagement or learning that they would need. So those yep. are my thoughts on it. Superintendent Davis? I, I think Ms. Bond said it really well. I mean, this is it should not be used in, in isolation by itself. There's an opportunity for blended models to be able to take place. Uh, teachers can go into the, this, being able to go into these courses and be able to self-select standards that students have not mastered or they need uh, additional reinforcement to. Um, that takes time and training. We'll continue to provide ongoing professional development through this throughout the year and throughout the summer. But I do agree that, that this has to be a, a coordinated and blended effort as well. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. Member Combs? Um, I've also had the uh, fortunate experience to see this program several times, uh, you know, at schools and also live. And I do think there's a need for this. I know I spoke to somebody the other day who had a very high achieving child who this the past year would not have graduated if it wasn't for this program. I think there's a lot of students who, who had difficulty this year. Um, you know, with online or just what was happening in our community. And when we talk about mental health and we talk about issues that children have, you know, to have a program like this to drive students to be able to graduate. I know at several of my graduations, one of my principals said that because of this program, uh, there's quite a few kids that would not have graduated if it wasn't for this. So I think it's important to have this, to capture this. I think it's important. We need something like that, especially I saw it at Epic North. I saw it at, at different, different places. And I, I do think there's a, a there's a need for a program like this for credit recovery, especially not just what happened last year, but as our kids transition back, I think we're going to find a lot of children who maybe never even logged on, who are missing quite a few credits. And this is something that maybe we're not going to need five years from now, but I definitely think is going to be a need in the next year or two. Great points, uh, Member Combs, <coughs> Combs, and I it definitely think it fills the need for sure. The question I had uh, related is the uh, the time. What's the estimated time to go through this curriculum? Do we have an idea on that? Mr. Connor. So each quarter is roughly about 14 hours of instruction. Yes. So you div times that by four, that gives you about the rough estimate for the entire year if you were to recover a full year course. And, and if we were to surmise and give a guesstimate on the amount of plus because of this program, to Member Combs' point, uh, to help these children, you know, succeed in graduation, what percentage are, do you think would, you know, this would put them over the edge to, to graduate? Do we have an idea? How many students would be taking this up? And so cur currently we have about 1,100 students through the summer Okay. So Whoa. not even including the senior, just think in high school, for, for example, we had 5,800 credits recovered. Uh -huh. Not every one of those are individual students because some students are multiple, they're taking multiple credits because they fill more than one. But think about thousands of students that if they didn't have the opportunity to recover, they would have graduated. And that could potentially, and what, I, what I'm really excited about this year is that we are expanding to the 11 DJJ sites with this going into next year. Which is, a, which is a strategy to address the school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. Because now students can earn original credit at DJJ sites so that they can get their diploma and hopefully rehabilitate and get back on track. Oh, that's excellent. So. And, yeah, and, and there again, you're reaching into the diversity, the pocket of diversity that, uh, that our district needs to be known for you know we are capturing those groups of students thank you for that explanation board members uh, I need uh, we have the motion let's go ahead and vote when your lights are on
Okay, we have unanimous. Uh, thank you. And uh, we're going to go to the next item. And this is 608. Oh, uh, just let me just do a segue here. We do not have employee co input tonight. Um, I would have missed the time. Normally we have it at 6 o'clock. I would like to encourage our teachers as well to please come and speak to board members, uh, when I say teachers, staff members, paras, because we want to hear your remarks about ingenuity, about Achieve 3000, um, Canvas. Uh, board members need to hear from you, and uh, sometimes we only hear about four or this about four or five teachers, and I always wonder why, you know, what are we doing wrong that we don't have more teachers and staff members? So, and Stephanie Baxter Jenkins, I'm looking right at you. So, if you can share, maybe there's something that that we're missing to to get capture their interest. Um, we want to hear their voices. So, having uh, seeing none, let's go ahead into the uh, next agenda item, 608, uh, purchase of second step elementary digital curriculum social emotional learning program from from Committee for Children, and Superintendent Davis will highlight, and Member Vaughn pulled this item. Superintendent Davis? Yes, ma'am, to the Chair. This is a uh, another social-emotional learning uh, platform to be able to, to help our children make, uh, you know, sound decisions, be able to help them with awareness, self-management uh, skills, social awareness, uh, relationship building, decision-making. Um, this was piloted originally in middle schools and some K-8 schools in Hillsborough County. Then we transitioned to being able to make certain we offer this to every one of our elementary schools within our school district. This goes on to be able to, to strengthen our, our work related to mental health and being able to leverage mental health dollars for this expenditure. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. Uh, Member Vaughn? Oh, oh, let's do a motion. A motion by Member Vaughn. Oh. A motion by Member Combs, second by Member Washington. And, okay, so Member Vaughn. Thank you, Chairwoman Gray. Um, so, <laughs> well, first of all, thank you, Ms. Brown, again, for taking the time to go through this, because I actually did have constituents reach out to me with two concerns about this item in general. The first one was basically or whether or not we collab we capture data. Um, if students are using this program, if they're interacting with it, you know, do they have a login? Does that, you know, is there some kind of um, assessment piece that would capture, you know, data on their social emotional learning? And from the information that I got from you, there there is no login. There's no student login. Um, so whatever, they, however they interact, it is not tied with the student. So from the data mining, when it comes to social emotional health, it sounds like this program isn't a concern with that. The next concern that I had um, was just whether or not, uh, once again, as we're kind of having this conversation about computer programs, whether when we're talking about teaching empathy and social emotional skills, whether or not a, a computer program is a good supplement for that. Um, and, and again, you help me kind of understand how a lot of this is teacher driven and there's a, there's a lot of supplements um, where the teacher uses this within their lesson. Um, and that they're the only ones who will have a login. Previous to this, we had a kit that we used where there was a printout, and all this is doing is giving the teachers themselves, not the students, access to um, the digital version of that so it can be used more widely within the schools and not specifically having only one teacher be able to access the kit per school. So I appreciate that information and really being able to understand how this program works because that's how, a lot of questions I normally have. Um, I still do have concerns even though I, I really appreciate this, that this, there's no data mining and that this is just used for teachers and there's no student login that's associated with it. Um, but I do, I do still have concerns as we're having this conversation, especially I would love to hear Member Perez's thoughts because I know she cares, you know, she's really passionate about mental health, about how effective, you know, I just, I, I wonder how much you can really learn empathy from watching a video or from a computer program. Um, so I still do have concerns just about its effectiveness. Um, I'm not is concerned so much with that the platform specifically I feel confident in that and understanding that we're just giving more access but just in general I do have concerns simply because you know it comes to seven hundred thousand um, dollars as member Combs had pointed out if it was a, a two hundred thousand dollar item it would be different but I do think as we have these conversations we have to weigh how much we're, we're spending because again that could be ten classroom staff employees um, so those were just my thoughts on it thank you very much 
Thank you, Member Vaughn. Uh, Mr. Porter, uh, what is the procedure for calling another board member to comment? Is this uh, acceptable? She can, Ms. Perez is under no obligation to comment, but she's Okay. Ms. Perez, uh, Member Perez, if you do not wish to comment, you do not have to. Would you like to comment? I think yes, actually, I was, I was going to pull this item and it was pulled already, so thank you. Uh, yes, my concern is with our children with their social emotional learning that when they go to, um, you know, do a program, like if we keep saying our, you know, our children are technologyed out, you know, that we ask, um, we're, we're trying to teach our children that when they have any questions, when they, when they're trying to talk to us, you know, that it's um, another a parent or a teacher or you know, a, um, social worker or psychologist or someone that can answer their questions um, that when they're sitting in front of technology that we're getting them used to um, you know interacting with a computer instead of another human being that their communication skills as far as when they're um, feeling something that they're interacting with a piece of equipment instead of a person um, that is my issue with having social emotional learning on a device you know um i cannot support this right now especially when our children are coming out of a COVID situation and they're they're coming out with some issues more so that from the front side of COVID, we're coming out of the back side and still not over it um where you know i rather than talk to a person a human being then um start interacting with technology to be honest with you thank you member vaughn for bringing this item um, up thank you member perez uh board members please vote when your lights are on Excuse me, Member Gray, I'm sorry. May I please respond to, to help Ms. Perez know that this is a, a, a program that the teacher accesses. This is not, this is, this helps the teacher provide instruction. This is not one where the student sits in front of the computer. This is one that actually the teacher is, instead of a paper pencil kit, it's actually the teacher has access to the digital information to provide instruction to kids. So this is actually for the teacher to use, not for the students to use. This is a tool for the teacher. And I just think it's important to make that clear that we are not substituting this program to teach students social emotional learning. The teacher is actually teaching it and using this as a tool. And Ms. Ms. Vaughn, you did mention the cost. It is $1,006 per school for five years. So I think it's important to note that too. I apologize, but thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Brown. And, and also this is a, you know, a once a week lesson between 15 to 25 minutes. So definitely needed. <clears throat> so Ms. Brown, I'm listening to what you just said. And if it's not clear for board members in the reading of the agenda item, perhaps we can work on more clarity. I, I honestly didn't pick that up, uh, at, but there's a lot of things I don't pick up. So maybe we can be more wordsmith some of the agenda items, especially now that we're overly, not overly, but we're more sensitive to digital programs, et cetera, right? So for what that's worth, um, board members, please vote when your lights are on. Okay, uh, all, all members uh, are in favor. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go now to uh, 611, uh, Mental Health Care Incorporated, doing business at as Great, Grace Point Mobile Response Team. This is new. Uh, Superintendent Davis, can you go ahead and highlight it? And I just had a question. Yes, ma'am. This is a, a new initiative for Hillsborough County to create a mobile response team. And one thing we, we know is that, uh, you know, our, our students during the pandemic and, and so many times our, our children are, are, are really faced with some, some uh, opportunities for intervention. So being able to, to leverage mental health dollars to add a, um, a, a team and to contract outside services with Grace Point, 
truly allows us to have a primary responder to be able to assist with quality assurance managers to be able to assist with our students. And this is where our students may be facing any kind of crisis or situation at a, at a, at a school and being able to have, provide a, a mobile response team to go to that school to really assist with any type of interventions that may be needed. This is where we will be able to have a coordinated, you know, a clinician psychologist at the same time social worker respond to be able to provide ongoing services services to our children who may be faced with um, you know, avoiding a situation to be interacting with law enforcement or at the same token being able to be uh, demanded to be Baker acted or hospitalized through an emergency department utilization. So this is really us, uh, you know, being proactive to be able to de-escalate situations within our schools and to create a, um, the least restrictive environment possible to be able to provide services to our students in need. <clears throat> so, uh, board members, can we go ahead and have a motion in a second, and then we'll have discussion. I need a motion. I have a motion by Member Washington, a second by Member Vaughn. Uh, will there be any discussion other than uh, I had a certain question? <clears throat> okay, Member Perez, and then I'll follow Member Perez. Member Perez, you're recognized. Yes, I am so excited about this. Um, this, I, I've just been waiting for this since 20, 2019 for this to happen. Um, you know, our schools have been needing this um, intervention team, um, you know, this response team, um, especially to kind of make sure that our students are okay and eliminate, you know, outsiders from coming in and Baker Act and students that don't need to be Baker Acted you know, um, being able to respond on time for our students. I am so excited about this. Thank you so much for bringing this um, to our Hillsborough County Schools. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Member Perez. Indeed, this is a great uh, addition um, for the well-being of our students. My only question was, um, uh, Superintendent Davis, when we have this response team, are we putting the principal in charge? Who Who is impacted? Who has to deliver the message? Is it Grace Point or the, if something goes wrong, who's the deliverer of the message? Yes, ma'am. It always starts with the student services team member at the school site. And when the assessment is done, they will work with um, our someone from the student services team to determine whether or not it's necessary to call for the mobile response team. They work to determine whether or not it's necessary to involuntarily um, hospitalize a student or whether or not, in other words, Baker Act, or if we need to um, have some other de-escalating de uh, efforts um, taken at the school with the student. But this is something that the student services team member at the school site or the threat assessment team at the school site will manage. On that team is a representative from administration. Typically, it's the principal, but it's also your school social worker, potentially a school psychologist, school counselor. Sometimes on that team, you have other members. It could be a school resource officer, if necessary, on that team as well. But that is something that would be through that student services team member or the threat assessment team, and they work with our central office staff to determine whether or not we need to bring, call out the mobile response team. Okay, so my question is, do we have a formalized at every school a uh, threat team? Is that a... Yes, ma'am, we, we do. do. It is required by law. So it's required, so we actually have a threat yes, team. Yeah. And the concern I had is I just didn't want another uh, job responsibility added to a principal's plate. And if that be the case, you know, that's that's really what I wanted to find out. Um, it, it, it is a costly situation, but you know what? Baker Acts are also very costly, and I know you're trying to reduce the amount of Baker Acts, uh, which has gotten out of hand. Okay, uh, board members, um, if you'll vote when your lights are on. Okay, we're all in favor. Thank you, board members. Uh, moving down to uh, 614. We're getting into more technology here. Uh, this one. <laughs> addendum 1 to Agreement 16109-DST-LG. That's not my initials, by the way. That is my initials, <laughs> Lynn Gray. Ah, Global Positioning System, GPS, on the buses and White Fleet. Superintendent Davis and Member Vaughn has pulled this item. 
Yes, ma'am, the chair. This is definitely needed in our school district. This really allows us to, to do a, a, you know, a, an efficient job with looking at GPS for bus routing and also white fleet. This looks at uh, routing for our planning perspectives, look at field trip management, look at uh, web query software to really make certain that we are being efficient with all of the uh, directions and, and roads and that we are taking within our school district. And that links to being able to make certain we don't have extended costs with fuel and we're taking routes that, that, that just really aren't, that openly don't make sense. So this, is, uh, this has been in the school district since 2014 and being able to bring it back for a, an extended contract to use these services within our school district. Hey, uh, board members, I need a motion and a second. I have a motion by Member Combs. I have a second by, let's see, one of you. Oh, good. Member Vaughn. And any discussion? Uh, Member Vaughn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Mr. Farkas, for meeting with me today. We had a robust discussion about this agenda item and transportation in general. Um, I am excited to see that this is uh, just one thing that we'll be using for hopefully a year and that we have something very exciting coming up after this. Um, and I also wanted to just kind of update because I had a lot of questions about um, when we talked about on the last agenda item, I mean the last meeting about um, electric buses. And I had a really great conversation with transportation today talking about still possibly maybe being able to utilize some electric buses and looking for partnerships uh, with businesses who would provide charging stations. So I'm, I'm feeling really positive about possibly transitioning even with our white fleet possibly one day to electric vehicles. And I'm excited about after this is done, the new software that we're going to have when it comes to, to being able to use GPS and, and accounting for our students. So I just wanted to take the time to say thank you for that conversation and not all hope is lost on electric buses and vehicles going forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, my son's thinking about getting a Tesla, by the way, of all <laughs> things. Uh, yes, so he's looking out for the electricity uh, depots. Um, board members, let's vote when your lights are on. And Member Washington, you want to go ahead? Okay, it's uh, unanimous. Um, again, reminding uh, the public that Member Snively and Member Hahn are not here at this meeting at this time. Thank you, board members. Uh, we're going to go uh, to 616. <coughs> uh -oh. Advertisement framework for the 2021-2022 fiscal year proposed millage rates. This is a tentative budget. Notice of budget hearing proposed tax increase and notice of tax for school capital outlay and allow staff to make modifications as updated information is received from Tallahassee. Um, Superintendent Davis, I know that you'll share the emphasis on tentative and um, I'll let you just take over, and this is your item. Yes, Mr. Chair, I'm going to I'm going to transition to Mrs. Johnson and let Mr. Johnson speak to um, uh, to this particular item and, and describe what tentative forecasted projected <laughs> budget would may look like. <laughs> Good evening, board members, superintendent, and constituents. I will be going do a brief overview of the tentative budget. It's going to be very brief. Um, it's tentative. That means that this budget will be changing. Um, Going forward is for fiscal year 21-22. Per um, Florida st statute section 200.065, the superintendent is required to submit a tentative budget to the board within 24 days of certification of the taxable value. The CHIM process informs the public about the legislative process as concerning property, property tax values, inform them that Department of Education sets the millage rate, local board, must levy, and also informs them the intent of the budget to provide an advertisement framework for the fiscal year 21-22 fiscal year. The timeline. So we're today submitting the tentative budget, July the 13th. July the 19th, the, F, the Florida Department of Education must certify the required local effort rate is going to change by July the 19th. July the 25th, we must advertise the intent to adopt the tentative bu budget in the millage rate. July the 27th is the first public hearing. July the 30th, the proposed millage rate final hearing date provided to the property appraisal. July the 9th is the final public hearing. And September the 10th, the adopted budget submitted to the 
uh, Florida Department of Education. I'm not going to go through all the, um, it's hard to read, I can see that, <laughs> all the other funds, but I, I do want to focus on the, um, the rate. This rate will be changed by the second certification that we're preparing to get by July the 19th, so it's going to impact the whole budget that we, is allocation. And also, we're still financially closing the books, so the books haven't been officially closed, so things will be impact. But I want to do, uh, is focus on the general fund. As you can see, the general fund, federal, state, and local revenue is $1.7 billion. That's what the pass-throughs involve also uh, embedded in the revenue. We get a transfer in of $23 million from capital. That's for $10 million for its property ins insurance and $13 million for pass-through for capital outlay. So that makes our total revenue, no, our fine balance, as you can see, is $176 million. That is significant. When we came in May, we said we projected a fine balance of $30 million. So I'm going to go, the slide's going to give you the detail why that fine balance is this high. But it's still tentative fine balance. It's not a final fine balance. Our expenditures we're projecting is $1.8 million. And then we got a transfer out of $2.2 million, giving us a net fine balance of $96 million. This is significant. As you can see, we're in an operation deficit of $80 million. We're still having an operation deficit, even though we have an increased fine balance projected of $176 million. And our balance of our fine balance, we're projecting to close this year at 96. So that's 80 million operational deficit. I just want to make sure everyone understands that we're still in operational deficit, even though our fine balance is tentatively higher than we projected. Okay, before we implement um, initial fine, um, the next slide. We came in May, we projected a fine balance of 32 million. But when we're closing out the books in June, we're still in the process of closing out. Our revenues, our federal, state, and local came in higher than our um, projections. And that was due mostly to the property tax values increase. Our local revenues are, were higher than we had projected in our budget. We were conservative. We had a decrease in expenditures, and that was in our salaries and benefits because we got other wages due that we're not in brick and mortar. Um, it's less than we um, identify in the budget. So we had a total projected fine balance of June 30th, pre-closing of 84 million. And that's before we did anything before the implementation, um, implementation of the fiscal recovery plan that we brought before the board to approve. That's where we end up, 84, but we're still closing. So things gonna change. So this is pre-closing, post-closing. Our fund balance is 84. We start with 84. Then these are the items that you guys approve. I mean, the board, sorry to say guys, but the board has approved for us to transfer. We have some penny items that have not been transferred yet or added to this sheet. So we are projecting right now 36 um, expenditures that's eligible to be transferred off the general fund. It'll be 36.4 as of this time, but it'll change because we still got pending items. So they're giving us a projected fund balance of 121 million. That's after the fiscal recovery plan, most of it been implemented. So we did get ISR funding and we had a projected fund balance prior to implementing additional eligible expenditures to ISR um, two funding of 121 million. Then we allocate additional um, expenditures because this is we have to spend this money by September. That's what we were told when we would allocate the money. So we um, allocate ad additional expenditures to ESSER to money that's eligible for $55 million. So we're projecting our fine balance to end somewhere at $176.3 million. So I'm just highlighting it again. As you can see, we projected we're going to close the fund balance, this is a tentative budget still, of 176.3, but our ending fund balance is going to be 96 million, and that's an $80 million operational deficit. Is there any questions? Thank you. Mm. 
board members, uh, at this time, let's take a few questions here. Uh, and I think we have a, yeah, we're going to do a motion first. I need a motion. I have a motion by Member Vaughn and a second by Member Combs. Um, and Member Vaughn, you were first in the queue. Go ahead. You're recognized. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so, so you're saying we continually have an operational fund balance deficit of 80 million? Is that about? It's 80 min million projected. We projected. risk this is a tentative budget, though. And do you anticipate that with the recovery actions that we've taken, as far as all the measures that we've put in place, are you, are you saying that after those measures are effective? Because I know with with a lot of the ones, there's it takes time. There's reciprocal fallout from that. So are you anticipating once all of our measures are complete, we're still going to be operating with a 80 million dollar operating deficit? In this fiscal year, yes, we're going to have a 80 million operational deficit it might be less we still haven't closed out the fiscal year but based on our projections right now it's 80 million and it takes time and we know that it's going to be more than one year until we get out of this operational deficit so we're going to be still um, making the right decisions to get out of this operation deficit for this fiscal year Okay, um, the next question I had is that you said that we got more in from our property taxes. How much more did we get in on local property taxes than we anticipated? What, how did that contribute to the budget? Um, I think it was around 17 million. Okay, and are we anticipating that continually going forward? Is, are we taking into account are we how are, are with that influx are we are we expecting to continue that kind of influx with property taxes or are we expecting to that for to that to be decreased going forward well we don't know what the projection is going to be because the rate's going to change but they're going to do the taxable value is going to change and also the rate and the, depending on that it might give us an increased revenue or a decrease in revenue we won't know that until um, July the 19th so essentially you're just recapping the year for us Yes. We don't really have a good understanding of what next year is going to look like. We're hoping with the measures that we put in that we're not going to be in that kind of operational deficit, but we're still going to have to wait to see how the money rolls in, what our expenses are, and, and what our property taxes generate. Is yeah, we'll have more, more information by the time we adopt the budget. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, Member Perez? Member and Perez, go ahead. You still don't have a um, timeline on the ESSA three funds at all, Superintendent? No, ma'am, we do not. And, uh, you know, as we're having a conversation today with the Department of Education, there's no direction being provided at this time. Are we the only ones, or that's statewide? No, ma'am, that's statewide. It's a good question. Okay, um, Member Per. Excuse me, Member Press, uh, if you're satisfied, I'm going to go ahead now to um, Member Combs and then I'll have a question. Um, I had a quick question regarding the ESSER funds. What amount are we going to legally be allowed to put to the side? I mean, is there a certain amount that we can put to the side? So when we say put to the side, the only thing we could do is, is really cover COVID expenses. So some of the elements that were in the, one of the slides that uh, Ms. Johnson identified are allowable expenses. And what that does is, is allows you to build somewhat of a, uh, put more money in the fund balance. So openly you can see that a, a lot of money has been put to the side related to a move to a, um, from COVID expenses to our general fund. But being able to use that to leverage that to um, to to get through the the multi-year of financial issues will allow us to have somewhat of a buffer. And I guess I have a question regarding ESSER three. It seemed like the federal government really allowed. You know, they said so many days because they wanted to get to get out of the district. What does the rest of the country look like? Like I know Florida hasn't received it. How about the rest of the United States and other countries? I mean, other, uh, you know, other states, how, how do they look as far as, are they receiving the funding? I mean, I know that Tallahassee has received the funding. I mean, so what does it look like yes, around the country? It's a good question. Through the Council of Great City Schools, we know that some of the school districts do have their money throughout the, throughout the nation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't
don't have a list uh, in, in front of me today. We can kind of look and determine, but I do know that uh, some school districts are, are being immediately uh, following the, the 60-day guideline and have accessibility to that money and starting putting systems in place. Um, from our side, we, we can continue to plan and forecast it, but we're at the mercy of, of that information being released from the state. Well, I mean, I would love to see which yes. states have already received it, which have, haven't, because maybe that will end up putting a little bit of pressure to Tallahassee. I mean, if we're, yep. if, you know, 40 states have received it and only 10 states haven't, maybe that will, you know, we, we need to make sure that taxpayers, you know, in our, our, in our, in our state are aware of what's happening. So I think it's really important that awareness. So let's look at what's happening around the country and why we're still waiting here in Florida, 44th funded. Number one charter, still waiting for our ESSER money. I'd love to know. Go ahead, Ms. Davis. Um, Ms. Kinsley, great question. So regarding ESSER 3, the, all states have received one-third of the ESSER 3 dollars. So the state, the state of Florida DOE does have one-third of the ESSER 3. The remaining two-thirds is released upon the state submitting an application and approval. As of this week, 40 states have submitted their application for the remaining two-thirds of ESSER three dollars, Florida not being one of them. Mm -hmm. And it was due June 7th. Yep, right. hmm. yep. And uh, we have Marlene Sokov, who's back from her vacation. Hopefully she will back. share that uh, situation. Very good question, Member Combs. Uh, and that is a reality, plus the other reality, and I'm going to ask a question, sure. is the, uh, you know, the due date for the ESSER 2, correct me, was September 30th, Wait, yeah. 2021, but now it really was September 30th, 2022. So maybe we should remark on that. Also. Yes, ma'am. I haven't received any additional uh, notification from the department in response to that letter. I, I would assume, and, and I probably shouldn't do that, but to assume the Department of Education will respond accordingly. Uh, tomorrow uh, we'll get a chance to, to see Ms. Pridgen face-to-face, -face and may, we can collectively ask her related to if that deadline is going to be pushed back as de designed by the federal outlook. And that'll give us more information because openly that September uh, deadline has really pushed our team to be able to find expenditures, which we do have plenty of expenditures to be able to do, to transfer that we're using for COVID. But it really changes the game related to what those services can be and, and will be used related to service and children in, within our district. So these are very uh, and, and thank you, um, Dr. Kemp. I want to call on you, but you look like you want to speak, so speak. Well, I just wanted to make a comment that the, the September 21 deadline is for the advanced lump sum portion of, of ESSER 2. So we had to have the advanced lump sum portion, which was $101 million. So our task force has been working on that as well as when we get the, the, the rest of that money for ESSER 2. We also have the task force in place for um, ESSER 3 as well once we receive that money. So Once we receive it. Um, my question is, um, and, and first I want to commend our finance team for putting together all those cost controls and uh, also, the question, and I know that you're not going to speak, but maybe Ms. Johnson will or Dr. Kemp. Um, the question I have is how much savings, uh, money in the bank, if you will, will come about from just the attrition, the personnel attrition? Well, one of the plans, I'll, I'll answer that. One of the plans that we had in place was to try to take advantage of time. If you remember, we've talked about time all year long and attrition and, and recapturing attrition, retirement across the board, abs absorbing positions where we can when they come open to minimize impact on employees. But when you think about, we didn't get to really highlight it there, but when you think about we went from negative $23 million mm -hmm. to um, a, a plus 84 million with cost controls and the mitigation. Now I want to qualify that. Mm -hmm. That 84 million, that plus 84 million on the fund balance, actually we make we we're projecting we will meet the three we met the three percent state requirement without any without any additional need for intervention. The ESSER dollars simply do exactly what the superintendent said. The ESSER dollars actually allow us to transfer eligible expenditures, expenditures off of the general fund to relieve the general fund. So you see it, it, it inflates from 84 to 120 to 176. As you 
transfer eligible expenditures take the pressure off of the general fund. Those one, that's why it's one time. It should be one time expenditures mm -hmm. uh, because we have recurring costs, and that's exactly why we continue. We, we've operated in an operational deficit for years and years, and it comes down to the, the federal, state, and local revenue that we keep bringing that up. The federal, state, and level. She's exactly. We, we need. We either need additional revenue. Mm -hmm. From a general fund perspective, we need to have additional revenue, and in the meantime, we have to stay. That's why we're in an operational deficit. So over the next two, three years, we still have to continue to hold tight on, on allocations to make sure that we're in class size, that we're absolutely um, at taking advantage of attrition through retirements and resignations, um, absorbing where we can, being fiscally responsible where we can. But the, I want to commend the team as well because to go from negative, honestly, to go from negative um, $23 million in June of last year to where we are now, uh, a plus eighty four, a plus eighty four without Essers, mm -hmm. and then with all the Esser one time transfers, you're looking at one seventy six um, projected. That that's um, that's incredible work, and that's a lot to do with the, the the principal's commitment and those that have worked in the field to ensure. I would need to qualify this now. We were able to do the cost controls over a COVID year. We didn't see the same type of spending this year that we may see in a normal in a normal school year because of, of uh, we weren't 100% face to face. But a great job for the team uh, at this point to um, start putting us on the right direction. We have to hold tight over the next couple of years. And, and I, I should be more inclusive. Thank you, Dr. Kemp, and also say big time thanks to our principals who also had to tighten their belts. Um, and, and, and we all had to do this together. It is remarkable. I hope that comes out tomorrow when we're in front of the DOE. Uh, so we'll see. But uh, board members, do you have any further questions? If not, we'll go ahead and vote. Okay, please vote when your lights are on. Again, this is the tentative budget. Thank you. It is uh, all consenting. Thank you. Just about two members are missing, but they will be uh, definitely uh, given all the knowledge and discussion points by way of minutes that we're going over. Um, board members, let's go ahead. We're going to go into 702. Um, and this is approved lease renewal with MacDill Columbus Corporation for classroom space for co career recruitment and instruction in basic English, uh, CARIB program for the 2021-22, a long-term uh, Hillsborough County Public School uh, partner. A um, little bit of a different um, uh, demographic, I believe. Uh, Superintendent Davis, you're going to highlight it, and uh, Member Vaughn pulled this item. Yes, ma'am. This approval lease renewal for McDill Columbus Corporation for classroom space for uh, basic English Career Bay program for the 21-22 uh, school year. This has been a classroom space that we have uh, leased since 2001. And this really offers an opportunity for English language services to be provided to uh, local refugees. This is money that we get from the federal government that we receive those fundings uh, to be able to lease property within the neighborhood. And the federal government really wants us to be able to do this inclusive within the communities in which we serve. Um, uh, this, is, this location, McDill Avenue, is really in the heart of the Hispanic community and to be able to leverage those dollars and use uh, you know, $15,000 plus of their money to be able to lease this facility to provide ongoing services to around 200 uh, projected and average students uh, for, for next school year. Was it McDill Avenue, and what is the other uh, intersection? McDill Ooh, to... I, I, don't, I don't know yeah, that. South and North. <laughs> it covers a lot. I know there's a, when I was looking at this, it covered the area of where many of these um, refugees would be. Um, but at any rate, we have um, board members. Let's go ahead and have a um, motion in a second. We have a motion by Member Washington. We have a second by Member Vaughn. And uh, at this time, any discussion? Oh, Member Vaughn, go ahead. You have a question? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that the superintendent and I had a discussion about this. I appreciate um, the conversation that we had. Um, but I think that we did identify that there's a possibility to expand this program into areas where we have a refugee population that's expanded since our original approval of this and also where we have a need for um, English English learners um, as well. So, you know, I just wanted to kind of double back and 
and on the record, talk about, um, you know, possibly expanding this in into the other areas, specifically the new Tampa area and other areas where we have, you know, refugees and a need for this. And, and through the chair, thank you. I think it's a, a great initiative. We had a conversation immediately after the conversation, Mrs. Vaughn, with Mr. Brooks, to be able to look in where we currently offer services and how we can continue to, to, to allow this to have greater accessibility. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to make sure we talked about that. Thank you. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Uh, and uh, board members, let's look. Whoops. Vote when, you're on. Vote when your lights are on. Can I say that again? Okay. Um, and it is unanimous. Thank you, board members. Um, next will be uh, 705, approve the real property exchange agreement, joint use agreement, and memorandum of agreement between Hillsborough County and the School Board of Hillsborough County, Florida regarding the Dorothy Thomas Exceptional Property. And as in Davis, Superintendent Davis, you'll highlight it and Member Vaughn pulled this item. Yes, ma'am. This is an approval of a real estate property exchange agreement between Hillsborough County Public Schools and also Hillsborough County. Um, this is a, an opportunity for us to exchange properties at Dorothy Thomas Exceptional Center. As you know, Dorothy Thomas currently lives in Portables. And for students with disabilities, we want to get to a part where we're transitioning to give them true brick and mortar facility, and this allows us to do it. So what we're doing is being able to exchange. Um, you know, we have a half an acre that we will be extended to uh, the uh, to Hillsborough County. That is a parking lot. In return, we'll be able to get two point two point zero seven acres, and in on those uh, in that plat, we'll be able to assume a gymnasium for our students and then allows us to be able to start that build and get students out of portable. So this will cost $1.2 million for our school district, but we're getting a large parcel to be able to move the initiative to better serve children uh, within our school district. Thank you, Superintendent Davis. I need a motion and a second. I have a motion by Member Combs, a second by Member Vaughn. And discussion, Member Vaughn? Thank you. Yeah, um, when I pulled this item, we didn't, we weren't able to have a discussion about it at that point. So, <laughs> so this was just a follow up to that because we were, we were not able to connect. So this is good news. I was confused about it. I appreciate the clarification. I know our exceptional centers are are very important in the lifeline. So to be able to see that we're able to offer those students a, a safer environment and expand that is very exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Member Vaughn. Please vote when your lights are on, board members. Mr. Hold on. Uh, board members, it's unanimous, but I believe Mr. Farkas wants to speak. I just wanted to say something real quick. We've worked very hard with the county. You've heard a lot of us talk about, you know, trying to find agreements. They don't have a ton of money. We don't have a ton of money. This is an example of a win. Amber Dickerson, her team, myself, uh, and the team over at the Hillsborough County worked very hard to put this agreement together for our kids. Uh, this is one of the wins. We, we, we talk a lot about some of the challenges we face. I want to make sure we celebrate some of the wins, too. So I just wanted to thank Amber, her team, and also Hillsborough County, Bonnie Wise, and her staff over there, because this is definitely a, it takes a lot of work to do a land exchange between two government entities. So I'm glad that we were able to get this agreed to. Well, and that's good news because we will be addressing um, boundaries and the BOCC shortly. So great news uh, and great partnerships. Uh, hopefully we will continue on that lineage. Um, approve the, the 1102 approval of the Financial Advisory Committee. And uh, Mr. Porter, you'll take charge of this. Thank you, Madam Chair and Board Members. You'll recall that the Board um, originally approved the idea of a Financial Advisory Committee some time back. You had a very lengthy Board meeting and discussion with proposed changes. Those are before you and your backup of both a red line version and the clean version, and we're at, we'd ask for your approval tonight. Um, Mr. Bunkley and Mr. Hart have also <clears throat> done an incredible job of creating really for the first time in Hillsborough County an online application process that the Board and Superintendent will utilize to choose your candidates. What we're proposing um, is that once this is approved tonight, if it is approved, that we push it out and we let our partners know who will be um, on the committee that they have a right to appoint someone. We're going to ask that applications be due on July 30th, um, that you would make your selections, your individual selections, by August 13th, and then the inaugural meeting will be on September 1st, the organizational meeting of the committee. So if, I'm happy to answer any questions, but this is something you've seen before, and it just really um, codifies what you've already approved. 
Um, and I want to thank you for the detailed work, uh, Mr. Bunkley, as well. Uh, you put a lot of time and effort, and it's very uh, detailed in terms of what it's all about. I did have, uh, and, and I'm going to go ahead and we'll, we'll do a motion in a second. I just want to make sure, did Member Snively and Member Hahn have any, uh, you know, voice on this before yes, we put Member it through? Snively had requested that we, um, the order of appointees, you'll recall that the superintendent gave up one of his appointees to have uh, the Blue Collar Union and Ms. Snively had a very good suggestion that we reorder the number of um, of, the, of the members and, and put the the the, non, the Blue Collar Union in place of where the student representative would be and put the student representative at the bottom. So that was her one suggestion and Member Hahn approved the changes. Okay, well that's what I wanted to know. So board members, I need a motion and a second. I have a motion by Member Perez, a second by uh, Member Washington. Any questions? And they will be directed to Mr. Porter. Seeing none, please vote when your lights are on. Okay, th this is our first. Thank goodness. Uh, I think the public will be very happy to see an extra set of eyes, uh, many eyes. Um, Superintendent Davis? Yes, ma'am. And, and first and foremost, thank you, Mr. Porter. Did a really nice job for coordinating these efforts with, with our staff members. Uh, we, you know, and all of our staff who worked on this. We will immediately start to push this out tomorrow and we'll leverage every one of our social media outlets, our, our websites, and to be able to encourage individuals to apply. And I think this would be a, a really good uh, step in the right direction to start rebuilding trust within our community and for uh, stakeholders to really play an active role of, of being a problem solver to make recommend, potential recommendations of how we strengthen our work and align all of our dollars and cents to our strategic plan. So thank you to our staff. Excellent. Can you remind us, the board members, of the date that we are due to send in a candidate? So um, what August? we're proposing is that we would ask that the applications be due by July 30th. July 30th. That you all individually would choose by August 13th. Okay. And then the first meeting would be September 1st. That would be an organizational meeting. That buys enough time for this to get kicked off properly and for enough notice to be given out and for, for you all to sift through the applications and make your choices. And Mr. Porter, it might be recommended that you remind or have the secretaries remind us of the timeline? Well, we will, yes. So that way we'll get we'll a calendar. <laughs> Just in case. Um, yeah. Um, Mr. Porter, when is this going out online? This will, as soon as it's approved, it'll go out tomorrow. Oh, okay. I think it'll go out as long as soon as it's, it's tonight. Yeah, I think that's yeah, we, ju uh, we just approved it, yeah. so. Okay, that's affirmative. Uh, Member Combs? I, I oh. have a question. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Um, where are the applications going to be available? They'll be available online. Um, and then On our we'll, website? On the website, and then we're going to push them out to on social media and the other ways that we notify people that, that um, things are happening in the district. So. And obviously we'll get a link so maybe we yes. can share it. Yes. you know to people maybe connected with us and are interested and right. then what what will the process look like so we'll send it out to everyone so the and then we'll get the application separately yes. yes you'll get the application separately and you'll have a you'll have hard copies you'll have a folder you'll be able to go through the applications and each of you have one appointee mm -hmm. and the board doesn't need to vote on those appointees so the power to appoint is entirely yours so the applications will come in by July 30th that's Friday, the following Monday or Tuesday, you'll have hard copies and you'll have approximately two weeks to then go through them and make your selections. And, and I guess we use our own, if we want to interview or call people, That's it's up to us. That's entirely up to you. Okay. We okay. Intend, okay. intentionally did this so that you own this. This right. is a board committee and the individual board members have the right to choose who you think is the best representative. Uh, to the point that was made earlier, I think by uh, one of the speakers, uh, the application really heavily emphasizes that we're asking you to be thoughtful about uh, people with financial backgrounds, especially education financial backgrounds, mm -hmm. and also as we talked about having really a sensitivity to uh, both diversity, ethnic diversity, but also geographic diversity, so that the, this entire large county is appropriately covered. Thank you. Thank you, Member Combs. Superintendent Davis? Yes, I just want to ask a question, and maybe Mr. Bunkley can help me with this process. So to Mrs. Combs' point, as applications start to go live, um, is there a way to have accessibility to all the board members so they can start seeing live applicants uh, at once, or well, do we, we want to finalize it? We really propose, since this is the first time we're doing something okay. like this, and this is up to the board and sure. up to you, Mr. Superintendent, but when Mr. Bunkley <laughs> proposed that he and his staff would get them as they come in okay. and create hard copies okay. for the board members. To, to create some sort okay. of uh, process that, that okay. is, that's not chaotic. And again, I think it's new. 
uh, for the district to do something like this in this form format. So I think the the, the idea would be with okay. that we'll see how this works and then sure. um, go going forward. If it's not a good plan, we could, okay. we could modify it. Mr. Bunkley is, and Mr. Hart have worked really hard to create a template for future use of, of this sort of online mm -hmm. application. They had to build it. It's never been done in Hillsborough, so they really deserve a round of applause for that because um, it was really Mr. hard. Mr. Porter work. and Mr. Porter doing a really good job on the IT side tonight. Yes. <laughs> good job, and and I would say that um, you know this this board is going to do a really nice job respecting each other's uh, appointee and being able to be a part of that process. So thank you and look forward to it. We're definitely the board is definitely on board. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Thank you for. Um, giving this the attention it so well deserves and thank you mr bunkley for your your never ending technological knowledge um the next item we have is just for information and um this is going to be and this is just the process i hope it's not too long because we're having a, a workshop correct on we this? do yes ma'am the chair we have a workshop on july the 27th so we'll be able to go deeper in this process. And I know that there's a couple of board members that, um, that are not here tonight and that, that really want to be a part of this conversation because of the impact of their communities. So we just thought it was fitting to be able to move that to July 27th and have a deeper conversation. But due to the, the current policy that uh, the board has, we want to make sure we get this out in front to be able to, um, to start the conversation about potential impacts of any boundary changes moving forward. Okay. Um, so. Board members, just bear with us. Uh, we may have missed an agenda item. Okay, well, this, uh, this does not take a vote, and it's simply for information. And again, we are going to explore um, all the avenues during the workshop. Superintendent Davis, what date is the workshop? Is it the 27th? Yes, ma'am, the 27th. Okay, and um, Mr. Farkas, why don't, why don't you just give us a, a, a New York minute what the workshop will involve? And I'm from New York, so I know a minute from a. <laughs> I'll give you as long as it takes uh, <laughs> Mr. Porter to finish the questioning of which item we missed. No, we, uh, we are very excited for the 27th. It's important planning time. As you know, Tyndale Oliver, we commissioned the follow-up on the long-range planning study. Um, therefore, Tyndale Oliver will be present on the 27th. Amber Dickerson and her team and myself will be there to kind of present. We had a great opportunity to meet with board members one-on-one -on -one and get some direction on what was the important items for each one of the board members. And we look forward to, uh, to planning and getting that ready. Again, as you know, there'll be a joint meeting for the BOCC and the school board in September. This will be a great precursor and get us all on the same page and educated about what some of the big issues are in our county and how we can work together to solve them. It would be wonderful if we can get a BOCC a county commissioner maybe to attend the workshop. Um, and uh, I did try to reach um, Chairwoman Pat Kemp. She is, I believe, in Texas right now, so she's uh, she hasn't responded. But um, if you would like, I can still work on maybe inviting a, a county commissioner to, to sit in on the workshop. Would that be advisable, Mr. Farkas, or, or what do you think? That's a great question, but it may be a Mr. Porter question. Uh, is a better person to answer that. I, I mean, I, it makes sense that they, they're informed of that, but I, I, that'd be a great one. I think, I think that that's a good idea, and I think if we do it, we should probably do it in a formal way, uh, maybe as a you know a, a written request. But we can, oh. we can certainly look at it, as opposed to a, making it casual, just sort of. Are I know we, you have a great relationship with the chair, but it might be better to have a, a formal request from chair to chair. We can, we can work on well, it. We'll, we'll do that then. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Board members, I think it's your turn for comments. Uh, if you'll get into the queue, unless I'm mistaken, and there's a hidden agenda item that got maneuvered. No. Are you sure? Okay, board members, let's see your name so I can start calling you. Well, right now I don't see anyone's name. Um, member Combs, Member Vaughn, Member Washington, Member Perez, did you want to share tonight? Well, let's go ahead. We'll put you down just in case you do. Member Perez, and then last but not least, Member Gray. Okay, Member Combs, go. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to make just a, a quick comment, and then after that I have a, a short video to share. You know, just 
a really quick comment that I wanted to make is, you know, I was a social studies teacher and I often taught students about like federal rights, states' rights, and local rights. And, you know, one of the reasons that I was elected locally is to represent Hillsborough County Public Schools. And so I really firmly believe in, in education and I firmly believe in, in parent choice. And so, um, I think that, you know, the idea of charters and all of that has people are discussing it as if it's something political and it's it's not political at the end of the day it's about children what is going to be best for children and i believe that if we have you know a a, a state government that is overreaching in hillsborough county often you hear that we don't want the federal government overreaching states rights and now we have states you know we have tallahassee overreaching Hillsborough County. So it is very difficult for me to understand. And that's the first part. The second part, if you're going to overreach, then at least ensure that charter schools have the same accountability, have the same transparency, and have the same regulations that public schools do. If you say that we have to have certified teachers, then don't bring a schools of hope here that don't have certified teachers. If you tell us we need to have mental health specialists, then don't be upset when we're unhappy that charter that charter schools don't have the mental health health, health uh, awareness, or they don't have nurses, or they don't have libraries. So I think at the end of the day, it's not about it's about what is best for children and how do we educate parents to find out what is happening in our public schools, what is happening in our in our private schools, that's up to them. But what is happening in the charter schools? Because every taxpayer deserves to know what is happening in the schools. So if a charter school closes after three years and reopens and doesn't have to show a grade, we aren't allowed to do that as a public school entity. Why are charter schools allowed to do that? So my, my main point is, if you're going to overreach into Hillsborough County, then make sure that the same requirements are permitted and guided in public and charter schools. So that's what I wanted to say. And at the end of the day, it's about children. Children like, you know, uh, Member Washington and Member Vaughn and I, we had the wonderful, you know, pleasure to go to see um, the Gentleman's Quest of Tampa Bay STEM Camp. And there were kids there from public schools, charter schools and private schools and we were all there to support them so we want everyone to know we support all children but we want to make sure that accountability is across the board um, so with that i wanted to share a very positive uh video that um that the three of us were able to participate in uh with mr myrick who um guided this and and, and he is in charge of the gentleman's quest of tampa bay and we can see some of these wonderful children Miles Jones leads his team in showcasing their design for a coffee shop called the Coconut Cafe. It did take a lot of math. It took a lot of Google skills. I had to look up a lot of the dimensions and make the act the model actually um, representative of what it would be like in the real world. Students taking part in Gentleman's Quest of Tampa's summer STEM camp spent three weeks improving their writing and math skills and exploring various STEM-related careers. They learned about things like architecture, blueprint design, and industrial planning. As a final project, the teens were given a task of designing a home or business using a 40-foot container. Well, I learned uh, interior design and um, taking into account real-life situations and like 
possibilities like the weather or where it's located. Students are encouraged to make these projects their own. They had to determine who their client profile was, where did they want to place this residential container or, or their business. Uh, they had to determine what was going on the inside and the outside, so they really put in the effort to make it happen. As for Miles and his team, they think they've come up with a winning concept. Absolutely, I think it could be a real business one day because we put a lot of effort into making it realistic. The teens are learning that even with limited space, the possibilities are limitless, and so is their potential. In Hillsborough County, Lori Davison, Spectrum Bay News 9. Thank you, Member Combs. And thank you to the Communications Department for putting that together. And we have a great Communications Department, so thank you, uh, Member Vaughn and then Member Washington and Member Perez. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I have similar thoughts as Member, Com um, Member Combs. I just want to remind the public that this school board was created because we know what's best for our district. We um, are a, a board that oversees to make sure that the decisions that are being made are being made by people in our district who have had experience in our schools and have a passion for our district. And there's not a member on this board who isn't really invested in the success of our students. And I, I find the, the fact that there is a flux now, an attack on home rule, which is local bodies' ability to regulate their own municipalities and make decisions for their own districts, um, to be anti-democratic, honestly. Our democracy is founded on representational um, governments, and the voters voted to elect all of us to make the best decisions for our district and put their trust in us. And for any state level government to supersede home rule and, and to try to take over or, or write letters when they don't like the decisions that we make or threaten to withhold funds that really affects not this board, but the students in our classrooms by withholding the funds, the ESSER funds, whether it's, you know, any funds in general, every penny is crucial to the success to our students. So to punish our students because any state board or any state government doesn't like the decisions that we're making that are being done in the best interest of our district to me is a direct attack on democracy and I think it's something that is very concerning and something that our, our community should be engaged in um, and our state in general because uh, you know we can't call ourselves patriots if we're not attached to the democratic process and allowing self-governing bodies to do what's best for them based on their constituents who elected them. Um, so that's all I'm going to say on that. Um, I know I'm over time, but I did want to just take a minute because I had a conversation um, on social media uh, this week about um, some books that my son was reading, and it led me down um, a conversation where somebody asked what our summer reading lists were. And I know Member Han always does a spectacular job talking about Mayan and access and summer reading challenges. So in lieu of her being here, I just wanted to kind of circle back to that conversation and I know we had some slides that we do have recommended reading lists on our website. We have it through Mayon. I know Dr. Han has suggested it. We partner with our public library. Our media specialists send out information. I know I've gotten an email from my principal. Can we show the PDFs that on our website that link to summer reading lists? Because the summer slide is a very, a very realistic thing. So we have to make sure that we're encouraging our students, our children to read, to be engaged in reading, to find ways to, to really enjoy um, so here are our lists that we have on our district website that you can find about recommended le reading lists. We partner with the Rays on one of them, and the Rays talk about giving access to reading. They, they have their own summer reading list. Again, if, if we have problems with accessibility to our reading mater materials, we have Myon, which does, re you know, it does require a log on, but if you have internet access, it puts a thousand books at your fingertips, and like I said, Dr. Han always does a great job. So I just wanted to make it clear to 
to all of our parents and guardians that we have um, support systems, we have reading lists. Please encourage your students to to get on my on uh, and do what they need to do. But we need to make sure that we're keeping our literacy skills a focus in the summertime. Um, and the district is committed to to making sure that we have the lists available and and partnerships. And there's a plethora of information on the website. So I just wanted to remind people of that and and, and encourage parents to utilize it. Um, and if you have any questions, you can always email me personally because I'm extremely passionate about literacy. So I just wanted to take the time to highlight that. Thank you for allowing me the extra time. Thank you, Member Vaughn. Member Washington. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, had, I tell you, I had the best time of my life uh, in the last week and this week because I had a chance to visit VPK. That is an outstanding program. I went to Claremont Elementary School and I also went to Notre Sassa Elementary School. And I'm telling you now, those kids are phenomenal, those four-year-olds. And they love to talk. They love to have a great time. But you know what I found out, too? Um, as in, and many of you know, if you've been in high school, if you walked into a classroom and they had students drawing, you would go berserk. My first, my first, when I walked in, the first thing I saw the kids drawing, and it flashed back to my mind, why are they drawing? We're supposed to be reading and understanding. But when I, when I spoke to, uh, when I spoke to uh, Lewis Murphy, he gave me all the information that I needed to know, needed to know. He said, now, when you go in, you watch how those kids, those kids' motor, motor skills are working. And I found out female motor skills are better than the guys at that age. Because when they were joined and they were uh, coloring, they stayed within the lines. The guys were all over the place. And it was, you know, it, it's kind of unique, though. You know, you look at it, you say, wow, they all over the place. But the young ladies, they were in line, and they enjoyed learning. Yeah, they, they enjoyed learning. And then they had a group. They had a group who were uh, reading. And they were just having a blast. They had to identify an elephant. But I got to tell you this story real quick. So I walked over to the little girl. I said, why are you coloring an elephant? Uh, I think she had purple and red. I said, why are you coloring uh, purple and red? She looked at me and said, because I like this color. <laughs> I said, well, you're right then. <laughs> you got purple and red elephants, I guess. But they are so involved in learning. And I, and, and I thought about it. I said, you know, if we can get kids disinvolved in learning and, and enthusiastic about learning, we could be successful in Hillsborough County. I had a great time. And I want to thank uh, Claire Mayer, and I want to thank the VK, uh, VPK teachers, the supervisor was there, Sandra Show, early childhood, Lewis Murphy, and assistant principal, Johnny Solos. And then when I went to Nota Sassa, I enjoyed the visit there because the VPK teacher, Bethany Simmons, uh, uh, Christi, um, Christina Reference, who is a VPK super um, teacher, Sonia Show, Sho, who is a VPK supervisor, Anthony Montoto, who I was happy to see because he's one of my former students. I taught him in high school, and and also assistant principal Lori Farmer. So I just want to thank thank them for doing a great job with those kids. Thank you, and have a great weekend. Uh, thank you, um, Member Washington. Uh, and with that, Member Perez. Member Perez. Hi. So um, first, I want to announce that August 5th and 6th, we're going to have a mental health conversation. Um, it's called Refre Return to School Refreshed, a Mental Health Reboot. And it's for students and parents um you know to have a conversation with their with their students and any questions that parents have um, regarding getting their students prepared to go back to school those students who have been on e-learning or even the students that have went back to school brick and mortar but you know getting them ready any questions they might have regarding their students and we're going to have backpacks and um, supplies for the students at those um, at those uh, mental health conversations, and I'm really excited about it. Um, more to come. I'll you know the announcements will be there about the what schools will be engaged in those conversations with us, um, but there'll be in-person conversations. 
Also, you know, Superintendent, I wanted to thank you um, for getting our school um, ready, one of the schools ready for when Elsa came through, um, you know, and having our students and their family in mind. I know that um, a lot of us were, you know, kind of, I, I work in the, in the healthcare field and, you know, as I was calling patients, trying to make sure that they were okay, that they had supplies, you know, um, I know a lot of a uh, lot of people here in Tampa, you know, kind of sort of don't worry, worry, you know, about when a hurricane comes through. But to to hear you say, hey, we got a school, but also I want to thank the teachers and staff who were willing and ready to help in case we had to have our schools that serve as a shelter. So I wanted to put that out there and let you know that I so appreciate what you do. Uh, for this community um, along with our students and our families. So thank you. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Member Perez. And just doubling down on that, thank you to our superintendent. Indeed, uh, I, I believe the evacuation center at Riverview, how many uh, families did we have attend? Was it 49? I think we were up to 41. 41 families. We were able to, we not only did families, we had uh, pets as well. So, um, uh, you know, we, you know, brand new uh, principal there just got, uh, you know, in, engaged into his the first couple of days on the job to be able to open up a center. He did a really nice job, Sparrow. So we think that the staff did, uh, you know, for, for being on site uh, through operations, safety and security to be able to help that process and also being able to clean it and being able to get it ready for uh, our students to come back from uh, for summer school. So we thank them. Oh, that's that's excellent. And yes, you were very proactive and uh, and and really well keeping the public informed, but also the board members. So we appreciate it. Uh, real quick, and I know the time is late. Um, I also, Member Washington, visited a few VPKs, and uh, and I was very impressed with Lewis Murphy. And I'm I'm glad that uh, that you saw the great work that they're doing. Uh, and, and the idea is to expand it, uh, the VPKs, and I know Ms. Brown's smiling there, but uh, we, we know that the more education we give, get them early on, the better they're going to do. And they are animated kids. My, my uh, granddaughters are, <laughs> one of them's that age, so how well I also know. Um, I think also I wanted to uh, right now just thank the Children's Board. We're going to have, uh, they're going to put on their first health fair next, it, uh, this Friday, yeah, at Dover, a very high needs area, Dover near Sefner, and open to the public, of course, and there's free physical, uh, you know, all dental care, every affiliation for health and wellness given to a high needs area, and the next week, is Leonard High School, which uh, Denise Silvina, the principal, does it every year. Thank you, Denise. But Dr. Maria Ross, who's in charge of uh, of all the uh, putting all this together again, giving the physicals, the eye exams, the the mental wellness checks. Also, um, I believe she's giving out the COVID vaccines. I'm almost positive. Uh, but ba basically, delivering the basic medical needs so these children can get into school, the immunizations. Um, and I don't know whether the public knows that we have these health fairs. We have about five of them. Uh, and um, and actually, um, Member Combs, there's one, if I'm not mistaken, at Lato, or there used to be. So, you know, we'll, 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 look, we'll look at that too. Um, I did want to say big time, it was a, thank you, uh, Member Combs, let me say this, from Hillsborough High School, we had Erignan Knighton uh, is an American male sprinter specializing in the 100 meters and 200 meter events. He holds currently the world record under 18 and world under 20 records in the 200 meters. Yes, uh, Member Washington, 200 meters with a time of 19.84 seconds. Now, mine was the fastest. I don't know what Superintendent Davis was, but mine was, the fastest I could do was 45 seconds. Do you remember your 200? Uh, I do not, but I know Mr. McCauley said he wants to race them. Maybe we can do pay-per-view and, um, and see if we can raise some money, you know? So, uh, you know, be... <laughs> 
We would like to see the wind blow through his hair. Yeah, well, we're going to we're going to work on him absolutely. It's probably in about 10 minutes. Um in uh, the youngest Olympian. The youngest Olympian. And, and the the idea is uh this is a, a, a under 18 years old uh in the world and I think uh, and from a graduate from Hillsborough High. So, um it's it, uh, there's a whole bio and uh so yeah. Oh, he's at, well. He's almost graduated. Not graduated yet. So, just just know that we have famous uh, runners in our midst, and our students are part of it. Uh, so, I just also on the boat that we floated with the bolts, almost near the bolts of uh, the bolts, we had a president and a, a CEO uh, of um, Lynx. But the point is. Penny Parks, big time contributor to our schools. She is she exemplifies uh, the CEOs. This is a quote in our schools, and she is all about saying to everyone and anyone who will listen. This goes to your point, Member Combs and, and Member Vaughn, the rest of us. She the, her first remark came about how great the principal in the school was. It was Tampa Bay elementary school. That was her first remark. Now, what does that say? Uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, I understand the, the pros and cons to the charter schools only too well, but there's only two things I think that we can put it in a nutshell. You know, all we want is equal accountability and equal oversight. And that to the public schools. I think that's the biggest ask. Uh, and, uh, but at any rate, we have tonight, I think, covered great things from our, our own schools, and uh, we're very proud of our district, and we intend to showcase it as much as possible. So thank you, board members, for your heartfelt comments, as always. And Superintendent Davis, thank you also for putting together a great agenda. Uh, thank you, staff, as always, for being, I want to say, alert. Uh, I tried my best, and now here I am yapping. So I'm going to go ahead at this point in time. Adjourn.